a very warm welcome to everybody on this third and final virtual day of the NHSR NHS PyCom Conference 2023. My name is Zoe Turner and I'll be introducing the talks today with my colleague Lynn Howard. So this is the last virtual afternoon of talks, but we have a couple of workshops in the remainder of this week, including an introduction to Git and GitHub and modeling nonlinear data with generalized additive models using the MGCV package. Workshops are restricted in numbers, but we do recordings, which we do share along with the conference talks on our YouTube channel. So do check that out. I think the waiting list may have opened for those two, so you might just have to join those. We're also looking forward to the in-person talks on the 17th and 18th of October next week, which will also you can also join virtually and tickets are available still for those. For this session, chat and Q&A are disabled in the Zoom as we're going to continue using our dedicated conference channel in the NHSR community Slack, which has been a success in keeping the conversations going well after the talks, which is wonderful. And if you haven't already signed up to the NHSR community Slack, it can be accessed through the QR code that was shared in the opening slides and at the break slides, and also via links which we'll share in the chat throughout the talks. Again, as we've said on previous occasions, a friendly reminder that we are a welcoming community and there is a high expectation of professionalism and conduct in all our interactions. And more details will be found in the NHSR Way book, which I'll share in um, particularly the code and conduct link in the chat. If you've been following these last few days, the format is the same. It's very familiar now as we have a short, we have short 10 minute lightning talks. We have 20 minute plenary and we'll be opening with our keynote speaker, which I'm terribly excited to introduce now. And I'll be passing over to Bruno Rodriguez on doing data science that stands the test of time with reproducible analytical pipelines, which you may have heard around the NHS more recently as RAP. I'm gonna pass over to Bruno, thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe, for the introduction and uh, for the opportunity also to come here today and talk uh, about wraps. Um, I'm putting this in full screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. I hope you do. Yes, I see some thumbs up reactions. Great. All right. So uh, I will be talking about um, uh, reproducibility and building so-called reproducible analytical pipelines. Um, this is not uh, something I invented. Actually, this uh, term reproducible analytical pipelines is a term that was defined, invented, discovered, however you want to call it, uh, by uh, some of your colleagues from the ONS, from the Office for National Statistics in the UK. And uh, the analysis function uh, that is part of uh, the, public, the UK public service is the ones that are really promoting this in the UK a lot, but it also caught my attention some time ago, uh, maybe a year ago now, or even more. And I've also tried to uh, bring this to Luxembourg because yes, I uh, work in the Ministry of Higher Education and Research in Luxembourg. Uh, you might have heard of that country, very small country, uh, sandwiched between France, Germany uh, and Belgium. And so uh, what I will be talking about uh, today is the challenges of uh, setting up reproducible analytical pipelines, but also the benefits of what they bring and more generally speaking, the benefits of reproducibility. And uh, I will also give you some pointers, some I will talk about certain tools that you can use uh, to achieve that. So. First of all, let me define what I mean by reproducibility, because there's a lot of maybe different definitions I will be talking or mentioning about two ideas, let's say. First of all, there's really the ability to recover exactly the same results from an analysis. So you run some analysis, whatever its output might be, and then you rerun the same analysis in six months, in one year, whenever, and you get exactly the same results. So this is one thing, but I also mean and consider what I would call replicability and not just, I, I, it's not just me that would call it like that, which is you have the same code, you have the same uh, analysis, but you get an update of the data. Maybe this is uh, some yearly project that you have to, to rerun every year or every six months and you get fresh data. And so in this case, what you want is that your results, of course, get updated, but the, the difference in these results 
can only come from this updated in from this update in the data. So they cannot come from somehow maybe in the meantime you updated your packages, you updated your computational environment, and and now uh, you get an update of data. You rerun the whole thing, but you don't know for sure if the the difference comes just from the data or maybe also from the packages that you updated. So the question, the big question is, and it's a very natural question that you should ask yourself is, well, if I have the original script, if I have the original data, then you know, what is the problem? Why, why am I here talking about this? Why uh, is this concept of reproducible analytical pipeline so important? I have the data, I have the code. What's the problem? Well, there are several problems actually. Um, it's all about certain risks that you need to mitigate. And I will be listing here some factors that can influence the um, reproducibility of an analysis. And the first one is the version of R that you use. And you know you can replace R with Python or with any other language, really. It's the same problem for, for anywhere. The versions of packages that you use. And this is, I think, the most common problem that we face because packages get updated quite frequently. And it does happen that some package works in a different way now that it's been updated. But also the operating system, uh, and I have a, a nice example here that I will show you, where you know the same code with the same data, with the same versions of R, the same versions of packages will produce different results on different operating systems. That happens. And also the hardware. And I won't talk about that because this, this is something that I think in 99.9% .9 of, of use cases is not does not affect us, but you know, sometimes it can. So you might also need to think about that in certain applications. Um, and of course, I will also talk about non-technical things, uh, you know, like governance and how work is organized, because this can also uh, have an impact. So versions of R here, I have a very little example. Um, before R 3.6, if you set the seed to one, two, three, four, and if you ran that single line of code, you would get the result 26589. After R3.6, with the same seeds and with the same line of code, you get a different result. And that has a real impact on the reprodu reproducibility of papers that were published before the release of R3.6. And actually, I'm currently exploring that uh, with, a, with a colleague. That, that there, there are some papers that you just cannot reproduce, you cannot rerun the results uh, because of this change. So you need to be able to install the older version of R. Then uh, there's also package versions. And I think this is probably the one that all of us have already uh, been confronted to. There's an update of a package, and some, now the code doesn't work, or it works differently. Here's an example with Stringer, but there are many others. Um, before version 1.5, if you ran that line of code, you would get A as the result. And after 1.5, you get an error error message. And actually, the error message is actually like the correct behavior. That's actually what should happen, because you cannot really subset the empty string. Uh, or at least it shouldn't produce A. That's that's a bit weird. Uh, but if your code, you know, if you have an old code, an old analysis that relied on that behavior, well, now you updated your packages, that's not going to run anymore. So this is a problem. And that's just one example of many. And actually, th there's uh, some criticism towards the, uh, you know, the tidyverse suite of packages um, that comes that you can read quite often is, is exactly this one. There, there are some functions that with time, uh, you know, the packages are not, let's say, retro compatible. But uh, I think now Posit has quite a nice, uh, nice policy when it comes to updating these things because first they deprecate the functions and you get a warning. And after one, like two or three versions, you get an error message. So you should have time to adapt, but still it can be annoying. Um, operating systems, so this is rarely an issue, but it can happen, and when it happens, it can be quite painful. Here I have uh, an example of a paper uh, from uh, New Pain and uh, colleagues from 2019. This is, I think, a paper in chemistry, and they wanted to reproduce the results of uh, another paper. And so they got the same data, they got the same version of Python, uh, they got the same version of the Python packages, so everything was the same. They reran the, the analysis and somehow they were finding different results. And it took them quite some time to figure out that the problem was the operating system. So they ran the same code, same data, same Python environment, et cetera, et cetera, on Ubuntu, on Windows, and even on two different 
versions of macOS, and they found each time different results. There is only an agreement between Windows 10 and macOS Mavericks. But apart from that, it was always different. And the, the, the reason the, res the results were different was because the, the data sets that were being used, that were being fed, the order, and this is quite weird to do, but it's uh, this is the way it was done, the order that the data was sorted on the, the hard disk, on the hard drive, on the computer, mattered because some weights were being applied depending on the order of the, so they were sorted like alphabetically or something like that. And it turns out that Linux, Windows, and Mac OS sort the files differently depending also on your language that you use, depending on a lot of different factors. And so this is not something that is constant. So the results were different. So this is also something that you need to, to really uh, be careful about. Now the work methodology. Um, so usually, so these are the worst case scenarios here. I'm not saying that everyone works like that, but this is like, let's say the worst case scenarios that I've seen happening uh, throughout my career is that you have each collaborator working uh, on their own laptops and you know uh, each collaborator has his or her version of R. Uh, maybe some people update the packages frequently, some others don't. And so the, the, the environment is completely different. Um, sometimes there is no version control. Uh, and so files get shared per email or per a network drive as well. So this is also not the best way to, to collaborate, but it happens. Um, there is no formal code review process and no issues tracking. Uh, that's also something that I, I've seen very often. Or when there is uh, the possibility to do a code review or to track issues, people don't use them, unfortunately. Um, and these, the, the next thing is a so-called code smells. Uh, so these are things that people do um, to the code or to the data that are uh, not, not the best way to not that they shouldn't do. So for example, manual changes to the data. So this is also a, a very classical problem that we see someone gets some Excel file that was extracted from the database. They need to run some kind of analysis and they notice when they open the file in Excel, they notice some mistake somewhere and they just very quickly correct it by hand and they can continue with the analysis. And that's all very fine and dandy, but then comes the updates in three months. They forgot that they had to correct this thing manually. And now all of a sudden they get the update and the code doesn't run anymore. They get a weird error. They don't know what's happening. Um, very often as well, the code uh, is written in a way that is maybe difficult to reuse, uh, difficult to test, difficult to parallelize, and it's copy pasted all over the place. And again, I'm not saying that everyone works like that or I'm, and I'm not you know, throwing shade on anyone. I'm just saying these are the things that can make it very hard to build a reproducible project. Um, and also another classic is that we don't usually don't have enough or not any documentation at all about our code or another one that happens very often and that is may perhaps even more dangerous than no documentation is documentation that is outdated. So I wrote my comments explaining my code, but I've updated the code so at the beginning and maybe I update the comments and then as time goes, I keep updating the code, but not the comments anymore. And so when I read the comment and when I read the code, it doesn't match. And that's quite risky as well. And so what happens as well is that we uh, run all my, our analysis, we run our code, we analyze our data, etc. But then we still need to actually write the final output. And usually the output is some kind of report, but it can be any other thing really. Uh, but anyway, the process of, of getting our data, of understanding it, of summarizing it, of modeling it is one thing. And then the process of like writing the, the final you know, report or result or whatever, it's, it's another completely separate step. And that's also, that, that can also be quite uh, difficult because going back, if you notice something while you're writing the, the report, going back to the code can be re really difficult sometimes. So to help us move towards reproducible projects and reproducible pipelines, uh, we can try to answer these following questions that I think can help us um, see what we have to do. First of all, let's ask ourselves, how easy would it be for someone else to rerun that analysis? You know, How easy would it be to update the project? So I get an update of the data. Can I just rerun it or do I need to, I don't know, modify my data manually in Excel or do I need to do something else uh, before I can just simply update? 
my, my project. Uh, how easy would it be to use the code that I wrote for one project for another project? Do I need to change a lot of things or can I just like load a package and simply reuse my functions, for example, that I wrote? And finally, what guarantee do we have that the output is stable through time? So meaning if I rerun exactly the same thing in six months, in one year, in two years, I get the same result. And by trying to answering these questions, we can see, first of all, what we should do. So for example, maybe uh, it is very easy for us to reuse the code because we use functions, we package our code, etc. So that's not a problem. This uh, box got checked, but maybe it would be very difficult uh, to guarantee that the output is stable through time. Maybe we don't have any guarantee and maybe we just hope that the output will stay stable, but you know, hope sometimes is not enough. So the thing is um, that answering these questions will help us and they help us build a reproducible analytical pipeline or a reproducible project. And they will also help us kind of be able to say, well, this to prioritize this part is more important than this other part. But the thing is that the road is not easy. And, uh, and I will hopefully with this presentation, show you some pointers that can move you towards going to this gold standard, gold standard of a completely reproducible project. Um, so wraps require paradigm shift. And the thing that we need also to understand is that we need to move away from script based workflows towards something else. So a script is already very nice. It's much better than clicking around in Excel, let's say, because at least you have something that you can read, uh, but it's not enough. And I will explain why in a couple of slides. Oh yeah, and that's the, the thing I always keep in mind and I uh, suggest you to keep in mind is dry wit. Don't repeat yourself and write it down. So essentially try to avoid repeating yourself as much as possible. So this already hints at using functions and write it down, meaning everything, every little thing that you do. So for example, you write some code and you test it in the console immediately, right? You, you, you write a little test to just check if everything works well. Well, that test that you wrote in the console and that you executed, put it inside the script, put it inside the script and rerun that periodically because that test will help you see if whenever you change the code, if there are some regressions in your code. So basically if your code is not working anymore as it should. So you're already writing it in the console to test it something very quickly, just write it inside the script and run that script periodically. So dry wit, keep that in mind. So reproducibility is on a continuum, uh, as was already kind of alluded uh, to with the, uh, with the questions. And this is a, 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 an image that I took from a publication from uh, Roger Pang from 2011. And the, not, the project that is not reproducible is just a publication, just a paper, just a, a report, whatever. You just have the results there and that's it. And then as you keep adding stuff to that, you get a project that is more and more reproducible. So if you add code, that's already better. If you add code and data, that's even better. And if you add uh, what uh, he called linked and executable code, um, then it's even better. It's fully replicable by and by linked and execu executable code. Essentially in our case, that's let's say the computational environment. That would be R, that would be the packages, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have all of this, then you can move towards uh, the gold standard. So the gold standard essentially is that with one command, so I need to run one command, click a button, whatever, and my project gets completely rebuilt from scratch. So this means data gets imported, data gets cleaned, data gets summarized, data gets modeled if you do some statistical modeling, whatever, and the outputs get generated. So if I'm outputting a document that gets generated as well, but if I'm, you know, putting, I don't know, some, some uh, trained model behind an API, ideally this should be, you know, uh, deployed as well in one single command. Uh, yeah, and this has to be true and has to remain true every time I run that command. So it's, if it only works some of the time, then there's something very wrong with the project. There's something uh, that, you know, this should not happen every time I run the command, I should get my results. That's quite important. So the, the cheapest thing that you can do, like today, there is really zero entry cost is basically use RENV because RENV will allow 
for you to record the package versions and R version that was used for one particular project. And then using RENV, you can restore that package library for later as well, okay? And uh, this does not restore the version of R, but it records it. So it records the version of R, but it does not restore it. And using RENV, you generate this so-called RENV log file over here. And it looks like this. It's a JSON file, basically, where you have the R version that gets recorded. Okay, the, actually, even the, uh, the, the CRAN repository that you're using gets also recorded. And all the packages that you're using with versions, et cetera, et cetera, get also recorded and their dependencies as well. Okay, so using RNV, you can record all of this. It's one single command that you run. It generates this file, and then you can later use this file to restore the packages, but just the packages, not the version of R, and that's important for what's coming. Then the second thing that uh, you can also do that is already a bit more costly in terms of entry cost, but it is well worth the effort, is using a build automation tool like Targets. So essentially, running a data analysis, whatever it may be, is very similar actually to building software. And uh, software engineers have had these problems for some time, and they have solved these problems with build automation software. And so essentially, we can also uh, build our data analysis or run our data analysis using such a build automation uh, tool. And Targets is a great package for this. It works really well. Uh, it allows you to define, essentially, uh, your whole project as a series of function calls. And graphically, it will look like that. So this is a graphical representation of uh, a Targets pipeline. And you see you have some functions one function to clean the data, one function to import data, one function to summarize data, and then you have a data set that gets transformed into a, clean, a cleaned data set. This is the output of imported data set on data set, and then that output gets cleaned by clean data, and then you use summarized data on the clean data set, and you get your final result. And it can be extremely complex, uh, and targets will keep track of all of these elements for you. The advantage of using targets and of using a pipeline, because this is now a pipeline actually, is that targets provides a clear view of what is happening beyond documentation. So using this graphical representation, you, you can see what is going on. Now, of course, this does not tell you how clean data works, how the function clean data works, uh, but you know that you run that on the data sets, you get a clean data set. So it gives you a nice overview. Because it forces you to use functions, so if you want to use targets, you have to use functions, it forces you to use them, and this means that they can also be easily packaged and reused for other projects. So this also takes care of being able to reuse functions easily. The pipeline is also, so we, we say that the pipeline is pure, this is a concept from functional programming, but essentially what this means is that the pipeline to be able to run and to produce the results um, cannot depend on any external manual manipulation. So the pipeline has to, from start to end, do everything. Um, and that is also very nice because it avoids these situations, these code smells that I talked about, where you want to maybe open the data real quickly in Excel and change it. It's also very easy to run in parallel. So targets keeps track of every piece uh, of your pipeline that is independent from each other and uh, it allows uh, you to run that in parallel very, very easily. And if you combine RF and targets, you can run the pipeline with the right packages. So by using these two packages, you can really solve a lot of the issues that I've been talked about um, in this presentation. So you can use RF to restore your packages, and then you use targets to run your pipeline, and you get your output. But there's still one piece missing, it's the version of R. So what about the version of R? Because here, as I said, RNV is not restoring the version of R. So for this, we're going to use a tool called Docker. Uh, so Docker is a containerization tool. Uh, it's something that you install on your computer. And what it allows you to do is it, you can, with Docker, build so-called uh, images. And from these images, you can run containers, and you can run as many containers as you want from that particular image. So Docker images essentially are, uh, you can see it as like as a capsule that contains all the software and the code needed for your project. 
they are immutable, so they cannot be changed at runtime. So this is not exactly true. So you can change them at runtime, but um, the changes are not permanent. So if you stop your container and you rerun it, your changes will, will disappear. So they're not, they're not uh, persistent. And they can be shared. So you can share these images, these capsules. You can share them often online. Um, and what is also interesting is that if you want, you can package the data inside the Docker image, the data that you need for the project. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also provide the data at runtime uh, of the container. So I, I have here a little image that shows you uh, what happens without Docker. So if you have a pipeline and you have uh, some data and you run that on operating system X with R version 4.2, you get some outputs, you get some star here. And if you run the same pipeline with exactly the same source code and exactly the same data, but on a different operating system and on a future version of R, let's say R 5.1, you get a different output. So here the star is slightly different, not totally different, but different enough that your project is not reproducible anymore. So with Docker, I have this capsule that comes with Ubuntu. Usually uh, Ubuntu gets used for that. So this is the base operating system. It's a Linux distribution. It doesn't really matter. But it comes with a specific version of R. And now what I want is actually to run this capsule. And if I run this capsule, I will always get the same output. And it doesn't matter on which operating system I run this capsule or this Docker image. It doesn't matter if maybe I have already R installed on my computer where I want to run this. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the capsule gets executed. Uh, it, gets ex it gets run as a container. And I get my output back. And my output gets generated inside that capsule. So uh, this, is, this is why we can use Docker to have everything we need, and then we are guaranteed to get the same output over and over again as we can run this image. So the gold standard with R maybe would look like that, or the path towards the gold standard. So at first, we only have RN. Then we add Git to it. And actually, I didn't talk about Git, but I think Git is really one of the things that, that people should invest because it's really useful, or maybe even start with Git and then add RN to it, maybe would even make more sense. And then to it, you transform your script-based project to a pipeline using targets. And then on top of that, you add Docker. And if you have all of these ingredients, you are really, really, really close to the gold standard. Maybe you are at the gold standard because now you can run your Docker and your pipeline runs inside Docker and you get the output and that output will remain stable through time. You will always get the same output as long as you store that Docker image, of course. But you can even make sure that rebuilding the Docker image is reproducible as well. Now, there is another tool I want to talk about because what I'm, I've been talking about are not the tools to do that. There are many other approaches to do it. And I want to talk about a package manager called Nix. So the first logo on the left, the snowflake thing, that's uh, the logo of Nix. And uh, the logo on the right, that's uh, the logo of uh, Rix. And so Nix, uh, the Nix package manager is, is a package manager that has been... Uh, it exists. It has been out for like 20 years, literally. Uh, it exists for quite some time. And it's a package manager that is fo focused on reproducible builds, on allowing software engineers to create reproducible builds. And it allows you to build reproduce or, or define reproducible development environments. And so there is nothing preventing us from using Nix to actually define and build a reproducible development environment for our own data analysis projects. Um, using Nix, you can install any version of R. Well, not really any version, but any version up until 3.0, I think. So that's like 10 years, at least, I guess, of, of R versions. You can install any packages since then. And also all the underlying system and um, operating system libraries. And this works on any operating system. It works on Windows, works on Linux, works on Mac OS. And so essentially what this means is that you can, using the Nix package manager, you can replace RNV, Docker, and actually even targets. You could even replace targets because using Nix, you can actually even define the pipeline if you want. Uh, I've been working on a package called Rix. So this is the logo on the right um, that uh, makes using uh, Nix from R easy. Um, it's still in development. It's not available on CRAN. And uh, let me also uh, say immediately that there is some entry costs in using Nix. It's not a very easy tool, but it's a very powerful tool. And you know, I, it, it allows you to replace these other tools, so maybe it's, it's worth a look. Uh, in any case, 
it's something that I've been exploring these past months, and uh, I will write a lot more uh, about it. So with all that being uh, said and done, why should we care about that, right? Uh, at the end of the day, well, building a reproducible pipeline, even if you're not really focused on the reproducibility aspect, even if you don't necessarily need it, which would surprise me, but maybe you don't, at least it improves the quality of your project. Because by, by forcing yourself to work in that way, it, it, it really will ensure that your project is better tested, better documented, and does not rely on any, you know, any code smell to, to work. Uh, it reduces time to ship because you have basically a framework that you can reuse and that you can uh, adapt to any type of project. Uh, and it also increases transparency and trust in statistics because, again, as I said, everything is defined in code, right? So there is no manual step, there is no uh, you know, no uh, email to download where the attachment is your data source or whatever because you took care of all of things because remember you want to rerun the whole project from start to finish in one single uh, line. So in summary, um, uh, reproducibility is about risk mitigation. Some risks require best practices like code smells to avoid this kind of thing. Some other risks require tools like archiving software that you need tools for that. Um, and I only discussed some of the tools. There are others. There's Rang, there's Groundhog, which could replace RENV. There's RIG. So RIG is a tool that allows you to install any version of R directly on your computer. So you might not need Docker. So this is useful if you, you, know, you work in an environment where you can't install Docker. Um, and if you want to learn more, there's the Quality Assurance of Code for Analysis and Research. So that's the, one of the books that inspired all of this from the colleagues at the ONS, at the analysis function. There is a book that I wrote that is available online for free. You can click on this link and get there, which goes into all the details uh, about what I've been talking here in this presentation. Uh, there, this is the link to my package called RIX. Uh, you can download this presentation directly uh, by going to this link. And if you have some further questions or you want to stay in touch, here are the other different links that you can find me that. And I think that was all for me. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I wasn't too long. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate. Thank you, Bruno. You've actually finished a couple of minutes ahead of time. Um, oh, the, right. There's already a, a lot of discussion going on over on the Slack channel. Um, one of the questions there is, um, someone's using an in-house R package that's not hosted on a repo, is that compatible with using REN? Yeah, so um, so if you're using an, an in-house package, um, what is going to happen, so there's two, two ways to look at it. So um, is the package like hosted on an internal, like on an internal GitHub or like on a private GitHub or something like that, then you that works. So you can just install it as usual, like from GitHub. And when you're going to use R and the link, and the, 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 the branch, et cetera, is going to get saved. If you used something internally, as far as I know, that is going to work as well, uh, but you need to like put the package, uh, I think as a zip maybe with, uh, alongside your project, basically it needs to be there for our end to be able to find it. But I've never done it like locally, but as far as I know, it's going to work if you do it that way. Our end for sure is going to keep track of it. It's going to like, write something i don't remember exactly but in, instead of saying that it comes from cran or from github it's going to say that it was local but but it's possible to keep track of it yes fantastic thanks very much for that um if anyone has any further questions pop over to the slack channel pop them in there um and uh, contribute to the discussion that's going on there as well um our next speaker will be uh, Sami talking about extending Power BI uh, capabilities by using R and Plotly. I'm going to be paying close attention to that because I've used Power BI and I've used R and Plotly, but never both of them together. Um, Sami, do you want to dive in straight away or do you want to have the 10 minute break? Um, I really don't mind. Um, I, I'm likely to run a, a couple of minutes long, but also I don't know if we should let people um people who are coming for that specific one to arrive but i also don't know if anyone will so <laughs> let's <laughs> um i suppose shall i kick off early 
or should I give it five minutes? I, I think the starting now is good if you're happy to go with that. Um, people can always go back and watch on YouTube. Fabulous. Great. I shall do that just now then. Just let me share my screen. Brilliant. Is that coming through for everyone? Lovely. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I, as Lynn said, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about how you can use R and Plotly to extend the visualization capabilities of Power BI. A little bit of background about me and why this mattered. And also um, just to start with a big caveat, I'm an R and Python person. Power BI is not my specialty, but it had to become my specialty for a project that I was working on. So at the time I was working as a data scientist at Devon Partnership Trust. We were a mental health trust um, and uh, a little bit of a plug, actually. I've now moved to work um, at the University of Exeter on the Health Services Modelling Associates programme. Now, this is a programme that teaches uh, machine learning, uh, computer simulation approaches, geographic modelling and all sorts of other fantastic modern analytics techniques. Um, it's our open day on the 13th of December. I believe a link will be going in the chat later, but also there is one in the NHSR Slack. If you'd be interested in learning about that programme, it's a 15-month programme, six months of training, nine months of project work, one day a week release from your, your full-time job. Do, do check it out. And I can promise that in that I'll speak a little bit slower than I do when I'm going through this presentation. <laughs> I've got quite a lot to cover today. So what's the issue? Lots of organisations are investing in Power BI. And if your organisation has it, then actually there's some really good things about it. It is a great tool for sharing certain things, dashboards. But you, you can actually be quite creative with what you actually make in it. The other great thing is someone else in your organization is probably taking care of the hosting and security. Any of you who've tried to get a server spun up for an R Shiny, Streamlit, etc., especially when you start getting down to patient level data, you've probably encountered an awful lot of headaches from IT and IG. And it's also really easy to manage permissions. There's some really fancy stuff you can do with row level security. So you can dynamically give people access to any of the data they should be seeing. You can set up different audiences for different parts of reports. It's actually quite powerful. And it does support R. You can use R to transform your data with a few caveats. You can use R to create plots too. Again, a couple of caveats on that one. And the same does apply to Python. So for example, here, when I've gone in and I've been able to choose between, do I want a scatter plot? Do I want a line chart? I can also choose that I want an R script visual. And with this, I those of the, you that use ggplot, you'll probably recommend that, recognize the default theme here. I've got a perfectly serviceable ggplot plot in my dashboard that I could then publish and other people in my organization could see. But quite often it's quite nice to have an interactive plot. As soon as I do that, I get an error message. Something went wrong. It's expecting you to plot to the default output and a plotly plot, an interactive HTML type of plot is not that. But you know, my users can just have static plots. So you can still tell them an awfully good story with a static plot. But you know, at least I can use any of the packages I want, right? I wanted to use the NHSR plot the docs package for quite a lot of stuff. Mm. Yes, you can, but again, sort of. If you're using the file locally, you are free to use whatever you want. Export the output to a PDF, take some screenshots, share the Power BI file um, with someone else who also has everything installed, and everything will be fine. But if you want to host on the Power BI service, which is what our organization was doing and a lot of other organizations who are using Power BI within the NHS are doing, you're gonna run into a few problems. There are some limitations to what you can use. For a start, you're going to be using R 3.4.4 from March, 2018. You're gonna be using some really old versions of some very important packages such as dplyr. 2019, a lot of important stuff came out in version one, a lot of things have changed, and a lot of other packages now rely on that. You can request support for other packages that go on as long as that package is, is on CRAN. Theoretically, Microsoft might add it. NHSR block the dots is not in that list. And uh, when I checked, someone had requested it be added and about 50 people had said, yes, I would really like that too. And there's tumbleweed um, from the other end, unfortunately. 
So at this point, there's probably still some workarounds. We could maybe copy in all of the relevant code that is, goes into that package so that we've got the functions available. But then each time you want to do a new plot, you're going to have to do that all over again. But that's fine. Um, but then you've got to alter it for all your new variable names. And actually, then what if someone turns around and says, I would like this tiny bit of formatting changed in every single plot that you have created? Perhaps there is a better way. And there is, and that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about. Our HTML custom visuals allow you to create interactive, plotly based visuals, package them up into a single file that you can distribute to other people. They can then go into the More Visuals tab of their Power BI install, select from my files, and just import the resulting file. And actually, there's quite a few benefits, not just being able to package it and send it out. On the left, for example, we've got the standard R script visual. What you have is the values box where they've, what you will do is pull in all of your different columns from your data model, and then you'll write your R code. Nothing wrong with that, apart from the fact, as I said, you've got to change variable names around. It's, it's not clear what data you might need to pull into this if you're sharing it with someone else. Um, the variable names, yeah, it's you can't actually change the variable names in there. Um, it has to reflect what exactly is in your data model. It's all a bit of a nightmare. And of course, anyone that's using it has to interact directly with our code. On the right hand side, instead, with the custom R visual, we can define what each of the data roles are. So we can tell people that they will need some values and that this will form their Y axis, some dates, which will form their X axis. We can ask them to pass, in this case, an identifier to facet the plot. Um, but it, we don't care what it's called. They, as we just care that they pass it in. Improvement direction target, you can have optional columns. It all becomes a lot more flexible. On top of that, you can make loads of different options available to the end user. They don't have to be technical anymore to interact with lots of powerful additional, um, additional settings. So in this case, for example, in the SPC chart visual I made, you can choose between a graph, you can choose a faceted graph, you can choose a card visual that shows the most recent value, a spark line and the SPC icons. You can choose a variety of summary tables. And actually, you can do things like manually set the improvement direction. If you haven't specified it in the data set, you can manually set a target, tell it whether it's a percentage. All of these different things suddenly are just a click away. And an example here is just one of the um, SPC plots. So all of this is using un under the hood, the NHSR plot the dots package. All it's doing is doing all the additional steps to make it work in Power BI. And here we faceted the plot. And the great thing about this compared to some of the other options on the market is if you're filtering, say, for different teams who may have, you know, 10 different KPIs, but not all of them have the same KPIs, it'll automatically make the right number of plots. It also allows you to um, manually set or automatically from within the data set, set your rebase limits, which is not an option in one of the most popular um, SPC chart packages without paying. Um, and you can also create summary tables. There are several different ones. This is just one of the examples that will allow you to have multiple KPIs across different, um, different localities. I've tried applying this to a number of different plots. So for example, here we have something that's generally referred to as a theograph um, for a completely fictional patient. Um, and what the theograph does is show the client's interaction with services in a very quick visual format. So a lot of the patient record systems are quite clunky. Um, it's very slow sometimes for clinicians to be able to go through and see everything that's happened in a, in a service user's journey, particularly in mental health. So these boxes um, show the full time that someone has been open to a mental health service. Each of the individual dots then shows a contact they've had. The red dots show an unscheduled contact they've had, say, with a crisis line or um, an emergency department. We can also show inpatient stays on the same plot. And all of this uses a very simple data set collected from routine data and is easy, to, um, e easy for any trust to pull out and adjust what services are shown in it. Um, and there's also a simplified version that's just designed for non-overlapping data, such as inpatient stays or um, if you're in mental health, mental health clusters, primary diagnosis, that sort of thing. And we've tested this with theoretically tens of thousands of patients. You know, you can actually, if you if you play your cards right, it, 
it's all it's not too much for Power BI to deal with. Whereas actually when we were trying to distribute these in um, say in our markdown document, you hit a limit of about five and the document falls over, it's too big, and there's so much more of a patient, uh, so much more of a risk in distributing that sort of thing. Final one I've created at this point in time is um, I took the code that Richard Wood at BNSSG had created for Nowcasts. So these are very short-term forecasts originally um, designed for the COVID-19 pandemic to predict um, bed, uh, required bed occupancy or requ yeah, required bed COVID numbers. Um, and what it does is just create a very short-term forecast using more advanced forecasting techniques than are available in um, in Power BI, and it's more transparent as well. You can see exactly, you know exactly what it's doing because you can see the code that has been behind it. So how do I actually do this? For those of you that aren't interested in the net technical nitty gritty, you've got five minutes to go and have a cup of tea. But for those of you who are, I'm going to do a real whistle stop tour through the key steps. Um, I I would thoroughly recommend at the end, there are a couple of tutorials that I worked through myself and I would really recommend looking at those, but hopefully this gives you a brief overview of the key steps that are required. For a start, you'll need to install node.js. This is a JavaScript runtime environment. It's just a fairly normal installer. What you'll then need to do is open up a PowerShell window. To do this, you click your Windows button, you start typing PowerShell and click on the on the icon that comes up. And this takes you to a sort of command line interface where you just type in um, type in commands. So you install Node Package Manager. Next, you install PBI Viz. Now, PBI Viz is a package that is created and maintained by Microsoft. And what this will do is take all the files that go into this, um, into this visual and package them up into this single file that we import. As of May 2023, there was a bug in the version of Power BI Viz that existed. So I'd recommend using the line, the code at the bottom of this slide to install a version that is known to work with our HTML visuals. Otherwise, you'll end up with a blank and wonder under what on earth you've done wrong. Next, you need to install some certificates. What you'll need to do again from the PowerShell window, running it as an administrator in this case, so could be a problem with your IT, set the execution policy to remote signed and install the certificates using the next command. This will bring up a window, a nice wizard. You choose the current user. In the PowerShell window, there will be a password that you copy into here. Next, you choose to place all the certificates into the following store. You click browse, you choose trusted root certification authorities. And that's it. That's all your first time setup done. You won't have to do that again. But now from within your PowerShell window, type in PBI Viz, and it should come up with something a little bit like this, a nice Microsoft Power BI logo. Next, you want to navigate to the folder you're going to create the project in. If you don't know how to navigate in a command line, I'd recommend looking up a tutorial. It's not too difficult once you get the hang of it. Create a new R visual project. So this is PBI Viz new. Type in your visual name, underscore uh, hyphen T RHTML. This is all you need to do. Your visual name needs to be a single word or something that's separated by hyphens or underscores. What this does is then populate the folder that you specified with all of the template files that the Power BI visual is expecting. You won't use all of these. There are a couple of core ones that get used. Script.r is where you're ingesting all the data and then saving the plotly visual. It's where you do all your normal R work. Um, the version numbers are updated in pbiviz.json along with some metadata like the title of your visual or a description of what it does. Capabilities.json and settings.ts are both used to add additional options into the customization panel and also to tell it what the different data names should be. So what we're going to do first is set up our input variables in capabilities.json. On the left here, you might recognize from earlier in the talk, we've got our values, our dates and an identifier. So we've got three types of data we want people to pass in. Within each of these curly braces, we've got a couple of bits of information about each. We give it a display name. We give it a description that will appear when we hover over. We tell it that it's a grouping or measure. I've never changed that. And you tell it what you want it to be referred to as within the code. Next, you tell it how many columns you want to be allowed to pass into each of these. So in this case, we only want them to be able to pass one column of values, one column of dates, and one kind of identifier. So um, in this case, when I talk about identifier, I'm saying something like, 
north, south, east and west or, um, you know, different different teams, that sort of thing that we'll use to pass it. Finally, we just need to tell it that actually, please go through each of these, these columns that we've set up and actually import it in. Next, you need to import your variables into your script. You actually, you can't just refer to them directly. You do have to first check that they exist. So for any mandatory columns, follow the pattern on the first half of this page. And then what you do is you go through and bind all of these into a standard R data frame. You're just sticking them vertically together. Next, we want to import any optional columns. So we check first again, whether it exists and that it's not missing. Um, if it's not missing, then we, um, then we add it on. And if it, if it is missing, we just tell it that actually we've got a blank column here. And finally, it's easiest if you now just set up what each column name should be. You can then refer to it as this throughout the rest of your data set. And this is where you make your plot. From, the, from here on, it's standard R. In script R, do everything you would usually do in R until you have a visual ready to go. Next, we can add some additional options in the settings file. Here, we're going to add an option to change the y-axis label. Now, this will look a little bit clunky if you're not used to JavaScript and TypeScript, but um, bear with me. Um, what you have to do is first set up a public class called y-axis settings in this case. This is what all of your other y-axis settings will sit under. So your heading will be y-axis settings, and then you might have upper limit, lower limit, title, etc. We then tell it to export this class. Pay attention to the capitalization. That's the one thing that's kind of going to trip you up throughout this. So we want to set our y-axis settings. Within this, we're going to have a setting called y-axis title. In this case, we tell it it's a string and we want it to be blank by default. Instead, I could have put value or something in there. Next, we need to go to capabilities.json and notice that we're going to be matching different capitalization from different parts of the settings.typescript file where we were just adding this first bit of code in. We tell it that these are the y-axis settings. We give it a display name. This, this is what will actually appear to the end user. We give it a description. We tell it that it's got some properties. The y-axis title in this case is what we're actually, um, what we're editing. And we want to call it, we want to show it up as y-axis title, the description when you hover over it, in this case, we just set the y-axis title and we're telling it that it's a text file, a, a text setting. Um, the, so it will just accept a keyboard input. We can set it to numeric, we can set it to Boolean. So it's sort of true, false. There's various different options and some of the links at the end of this will tell you all the different options that exist. Finally, we just need to fill in the key information about our visual. You'll quite frequently want to update the version number here as well when you add in new features, but at a minimum, we need to fill in the, the things I've shown here. Otherwise, it won't compile. And now we can package our file in your PowerShell window. Make sure you're still in the same folder we were when we started, or when we were creating this, and just run the command PBI viz package. That will then bundle it all up. As long as there's no warnings on this page, you will get a lot of info. But as long as there's no warnings, you're uh, not warnings, errors, you're fine. Um, and then we go to the dist folder and find our PBI viz file. Now we can import it and enjoy the visual we've just created. So for more visuals, we go to my files and then voila. So there are a couple of limitations of this approach. The number one thing for me is that they're a bit slow. So when I'm saying slow, I'm talking, they might take between five and 10 seconds to load, depending on how complex they are. Whereas a, a, a standard Power BI visual may load within a second. You, you know, your user may not even notice the loading. What you can do is minimize the size of the plot libraries when you're saving your figure um, using the following command. Um, this can take the loading down from about four megabytes to maybe two, two, um, 200 kilobytes. Also, anecdotally, each object you create gets written out to a temporary environment. So just create as few intermediate objects as possible. The Power BI service package, package limitations do still apply. You're going to have to go digging around to find out what will and what won't work. Um, but you can find that out from package documentation. It doesn't behave completely like a Power BI visual. So if your user clicks on something expecting it to cross filter a table, that obviously won't happen. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing for your end user, but where it's needed, it really works. It's not easy to test them online. Testing online is very useful, a bit of a pain if you don't actually have a Power BI account. Microsoft are quite picky about who they'll let make an account. Uh, have a chat to me if this is a situation you're in, I can 
give you some guidance on how to create um, an official email that Microsoft will recognize. Setting up a test environment is also tricky. If you're debugging something, it's very helpful to be doing some doing that on your machine. So you'll need the package versions that um, Power BI service uses. At the moment, I've just got a bare bones script that sets up all the correct package files in the right order with all of the correct versions. Um, but it doesn't currently cover every package that's available, but this is something that's available in some of the repositories I'll share at the end. And finally, a couple of quick tips. Start simple, don't even add settings, to be honest, just start with the simplest visual you can create and all the bells and whistles can be added on afterwards. ggplotly is magic. If you can write a ggplot plot, you can make an interactive plot. Wrap it in ggplotly, open brackets, all your code, close brackets, and suddenly you have an interactive plot. This will work in a lot of cases. It doesn't just have to be plots. As I mentioned, it could be any HTML output. So tables, uh, data table in particular is one I've worked with. It's a bit finicky, but it does work. Um, if you use the standard R visual template, so R visual instead of R HTML, it doesn't have to be interactive, but you still get the benefits of a reproducible, shareable, customizable, easy to use plot. A couple of closing thoughts on this. I think this is a really powerful way to extend what Power BI is capable of and a really powerful way to showcase to your organization what R is capable of as well. Suddenly having something that's on the fly, interactive can really drive things forward. And then when they start going, well, why can't it be faster? Why can't you do with this with it? Then you've got a really powerful way of demonstrating your use case for um, for something like uh, a shiny server. They shouldn't be used where a native visual will do the job. As I say, they're slower, they're more complicated to maintain. Um, but where they're needed, they're fantastic. Consider the Deneb project as an alternative. So what this is, is a you can download this from within the Microsoft Store when you go to add new visuals. Um, this uses the Vega or Vega Lite language. This is also used by certain packages such as Altair. It's a language that there's a lot of documentation before that allows you to create plots, but it's gonna be a lot faster, much closer to native visual speed. And I just want to close with um, a quote from Philippe Kahn, the power of open source, the power of the people, the people rule. I couldn't have done any of this without all the work that NHS, um, the NHS I'll plot the dots team had done without the work that Richard Wood had done. Um, I wouldn't have got it off the ground without all this fantastic stuff to start with. So all, all I can say is everything's on GitHub. Go to the dist folder and download any of these, try them out. There's example documents, etc. And uh, please do feedback, add issues, anything like that. Um, and I shall close off there. Wow, thank you very much, Sammy. I can see that this is going to be a section of the video that uh, has people um, pausing and rewinding and rewatching the sections as they go through your very detailed instructions. Um, so thank you very much for that indeed. If anybody has any questions, head over to the Slack channel. Uh, there's already started a little bit of a discussion on there about how to actually get uh, this implemented within our NHS organisations. Um, Brilliant, I shall go and have a look. A question has just popped up there. Uh, can you share the slide links? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I will get those uh, shared um, well as soon as possible. Fantastic. I'm sure that will be very much appreciated. Uh, and also people saying how amazing they thought your presentation was. So thank you very much again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Cara, who um, today is talking to us about more than pretty graphs. So uh, setting a high bar for yourself there, Cara. Well, I think so. It's also about making the case that it's not just about making things pretty, but it's also about being functional and saving everybody a lot of time in the process. <laughs> great, great stuff, take it away. Great, thank you very much. So I'll just share my screen um, and hopefully you can all see a title slide and I get a thumbs up from somebody and it appears great, thank you very much. So yes, um, I am today gonna to be talking about building a database design system for a medical research project. Um, and it's about more than pretty graphs, it's about how we implement things so that people can focus on where their area of specialism is um, and so that the graphs that they create can have that impact um, that we're all looking for, for for the work that we do. And thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I really enjoyed the in-person conference last year. It was it was a lot of fun. I'm sad not to be able to make the in-person one this 
this time around, but I'm great. Uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to be here um, online with you all. Um, let me just uh, share the, the starting slide. So as we're in introduction, I'm Cara Thompson, um, and I'm a data visualization consultant. Um, and the way I ended up here was growing up with a love for patterns in music and in language. Um, and a fascination with the human brain and how we process noise and make sense of it um, and how we process visuals and make sense of it as well. Ended up taking all of that into a PhD in psychology where I played people silly sentences and music with chords that didn't belong in the right key um, and saw how the brain reacted to that, which was great fun. Um, and from there, went on to the world of postgrad medical exams where I spent about a decade talking to surgeons about data patterns in exams. Um, and discovered that I had a knack for using visualizations as a great shortcut to get them to understand very quickly what were ultimately quite complex patterns uh, that we were seeing in the data. The thing that drives me in all of this is the desire to help others maximize the impact of their expertise, uh, whether that's by making the stuff that they create more visually memorable for people, um, or by taking away some of the thorns and thistles of, of everyday work um, and automating the, the boring stuff. Uh, so that they can focus on the stuff that really needs their expertise rather than them spending ages faffing around in Excel with colors, uh, which is what people sometimes end up doing. And just in case we've had some fun conversations at the conference last year, yes, this is me. Uh, we all struggle to uh, recognize each other from our avatars because we all pick avatars that we're, we're happy with. Um, so if you've been following this, like, this space online, that's me. Um, now that we've migrated, well, everybody's kind of found their feet again since the great Twitter transition. Um, I'm posting probably more on LinkedIn than I used to on, on Twitter. So if you want to find me there, that's what the QR code will take you to. But the other fun conversation I had last year was with uh, Ryan, who was across from Posit. He said, ah, oh, the Bake Off plot, that was you. I didn't realize that was you. So I realized at that point that one of my plots was more recognizable than my face, and um, which is probably the ultimate win for somebody who's in the business of making memorable plots. But still, it was a funny conversation. So anyway, if you, if you want to give me, this is me, and uh, that's where you can find me. But today we're going to be talking about creating a data design system and implementing it as a custom R package so that people can go from plots that look like this, which we've all grown to know and love as um, kind of a startup GG plot, to plots that look like this with just two extra lines of code. Um, and it's all taking away some of that um, trial and error in creating a plot in that design process. Um, and making sure that you can spend the time in the way that's most valuable for you, where you will add the most impact to, to your research project. So this is a behind the scenes of how I went about building this. And I've talked about this before at a conference, but actually this time I've added some things in and I ended up building some more things uh, for the client in, in the process of constructing this talk. So that was good value for everybody, hopefully. And um, so what is a data viz design system? The best way to think about it is a set of data viz friendly brand guidelines. So you want a set of colors that you're going to use, you want a set of fonts that you're going to use, and you want some simple rules that you're going to use to apply these to different things. And um, so which font goes in the title, which one goes in the subtitle, where do you use your colors, how do you pair them with various things. But what is it that makes it data viz friendly? Well, there are a few extra constraints that we need to think about when we're creating visualizations. We want to try where we can to use purposeful color semantics. So those of you that were at my workshop last week, we talked a bit about this, about how we can intuitively pair colors with concepts, um, and that makes it easier to interpret what's going on in the graph. We want to use data viz friendly text formatting. So there's text that works really well as display text um, or really well as body text, but we need to think about it a little bit more carefully when it's inside a visualization to make sure that it works in the way that we need it to. We can add into the, the data viz side of it any preferred geometries that we like to use. So if you prefer to have geom bar or geom chiclet or whatever it is that you want to use, you can specify that within your data viz design system. Um, and we want to have accessibility baked in from the very start. So we want to make sure that the colors we're choosing work well from an accessibility, accessibility point of view, and that the fonts that we're choosing work well, um, and that we've considered all of these things together when we've put the data viz design system in place. And then we can take all of this and apply it wherever we want to. So we can apply it to graphs, we can apply it to tables, which I would encourage you to think of tables as a form of data viz. And it takes a bit of a mindset shift to, to get to there, but, but tables are a form of data visualization. And you can apply it to your presentations, to any documents that you create, to any quarter slides that you create. And once you've got those foundations there, 
um, it's really there to help you uh, make sure that you get a consistent visual identity and also take away all of that decision making that you make when you're trying to put together a presentation. So it's more than pretty graphs. It's that clear visual identity. Again, as I said, it's taking away that trial and error and the decision making energy that you put into these kind of things. Um, and for those of us that like using R, uh, we can automate what some people might think of as the boring stuff, which I actually really quite enjoy, um, so that we can focus on the stuff that needs our expertise. There are three pillars to a database design system. We want it to be functional. We want it to have a nice aesthetic that represents us well. And we want to implement it in such a way that it's easy to use. So from the functional point of view, we're looking at the text hierarchy. Does the main thing stand out as the main thing? We're looking at how many colors we need and how they work together with the concepts that we're talking about. And we're looking at accessibility. In terms of the aesthetic, we want it to be on brand. We want it to have the right amount of personality. And then there are some nice extras that we can throw in, like having a background for the plots or some various toggles that we can play with in the options. And in terms of implementation, especially in, you know, in my case when I'm creating this for someone else, but I think I would encourage you to do this for yourselves as well, make your documentation nice and clear so that anyone else picking it up can read the documentation and understand very quickly how to use it. We want to automate as much of the stuff as we can. So whether that's looking at um, scaling the text and making sure that the margins of the plot state scale accordingly, um, or just making it easy to quickly bring it into a ggplot. And, and we also want to build in some flexibility so that people don't feel constrained by it, but that they feel that it is uh, just a really good framework to take away some of the hassle of creating things, but that they can continue building on it um, if they want to make some further modifications. So without further ado, uh, let's go. The first step in the process is obviously to gather the requirements that you need. So I set up a call uh, with Dr. Claire Meek. Uh, it was for her team that I created this package. And she was working on a research project called the Ophelia Project, which is looking at, uh, it's a medical research project, um, looking at ladies with gestational diabetes and trying to figure out um, what's going on and treatment options, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a conversation about what she would need. So how many colors and what kind of colours, first of all, did she want to be associated with this project? And her answer was a fun one. It was, I want something feminine, but not sickly sweet. I thought, okay, that's good. We can we can work with those parameters. I then asked her how many colours she thought that she would need. And my heart did sink a little bit when she said something like, oh, maybe 20, 25. And that's a lot of colours. Um, and I wouldn't recommend using that number of colours in the same plot. But actually, for some of the plots that she's creating, it does work because she's just putting them next to each other. So all you need is a slight variation and then you can see the distinct groups of dots um, that she's representing. But anyway, so right, okay, I'm, I'm up for the challenge. We'll see what we can do. Um, any color semantics that we should, should include? And um, she was looking at lots of different things, but the, the main one that she wanted was a positive to negative scale that wasn't red and green. She wanted something that was a little bit different from that and that tied in with the aesthetic that we were coming up with. Um, I also asked her about any types of plots that she tends to use a lot so that I could mock up those kind of plots when I was creating these colours to see whether they would work well for her. And also how much personality she wanted to convey in the text formatting. Uh, she's a very friendly and approachable person, but also needs that dose of professionalism in the plots. So I, I think we came up with something that was a really good compromise uh, between all of these. Not that you can't be friendly and professional at the same time. I think those two things do go together quite nicely. So the first thing was thinking about colour inspiration. Um, and a few weeks after I had the conversation with Claire, I was in an exhibition um, of Leon Morocco's paintings. He did an exhibition in uh, up in Edinburgh um, and came across this one, which um, just seems, I, I just really like it. I was really struck by the colours in it um, and thought it fitted the bill really nicely as well. It's got that feminine, but not sickly sweet aspect to it. And um, seeing the painting in, in real life, you know, in the flesh was, um, I don't feel, feel that this photo does it justice. The colors are more vibrant than that. Um, but it was a really great starting point for thinking, okay, how can I use this and create a color palette um, that merges this in with the colors that she had in her logo um, and just allows us to create something with the aesthetic that she wants. So as, uh, as I tend to do, I like starting from a photo um, and then I use a tool called imagecolorpicker.com. There are plenty of other tools that are similar to this to pick out some colors. I'll just do a quick demo of how that works actually so that you can do this at home as well if you want to. So if you copy your image and then go to the website, um, you can then paste your image in um, and then click on various points of it and it will give you the hex code that corresponds to the color, um, which is quite a neat trick to do. Um, and tell you what, why don't I just pick 
this one in the middle here. I'm going to copy that. Oh, um, and then what I do after that is um, take it over to the palette helper. And um, so once I've found a set of colors that I quite like, um, I take them over to the site with the palette helper uh, and I've linked both of these um, on the, the page on my website that has this talk on it so you can have a look. So you can feed the colors in and um, change the colors around. Obviously, I'm only changing the middle one here. You would want to change a lot of other ones. But what's great about this tool is that you can just feed it three colors and say you need nine or 10 or 32, <laughs> um, and it will interpolate between them while also keeping an eye on um, colorblind simulations to make sure that it still works for people who have different types of uh, color vision impairment. So um, it's a great tool. It then creates all the hex codes that you need down here if you want to come and, and use them manually, but there are other ways of doing that, which we'll come back to. So this was our inspiration for the, the colors, um, and that's a quick uh, tip for you if you want to go ahead and uh, do something similar at home. Um, and I fed those colors into the color palette helper, um, and you see I fed uh, seven colors into it as anchor colors, and then I asked it for nine, and I thought I'd push it and see what happens, and I got up to 32. Um, that it said was still colorblind safe. So woo we managed to get this challenge sorted that Claire wanted, you know, above 20 colors. Uh, hopefully 32 <laughs> will do the trick. Um, but I think that the key here is having a good variation in both the hue and the light and dark, um, so sort of light and dark value of the colors as well, so that you can create these color schemes that work well um, and that, that uh, scale um, in different contexts as well. Just a side note, when we think about accessibility, it's so much more than just red and green. Um, there's lots of different types of color perception differences. Some people struggle with green, some with red, some with blue, and some with combinations of all of those. It's not just about red and green, which is the obvious one that people think of. But accessibility is also about um, neurodivergent audiences and making sure that we create stuff that is accessible and that works well for them. Um, and there are lots of different things that we need to, to take on board with that. And um, I've had this on my desk for a while and I showed it at the, the workshop. Um, the latest Nightingale magazine had a really great section on accessibility in the middle of that. And so I picked out some of the top tips that they shared for how to make sure that we create uh, visualizations that work well uh, for everyone. So this is just using shades of the same color rather than lots of different colors. Um, and that makes a lot of sense as well if you're creating things uh, with color semantics. It makes us makes it easier for us to group things together. And um, they suggest using muted colors rather than stark colors. We've done this here uh, because the, the photo, of, well, that photo in, in, that we started with had some muted colors in it. And um, less is more, don't try and overwhelm your audience with information or with colors. Um, and try again to use light, light and dark variation um, as well as changes um, in, in the hue for your colors to create your color schemes. So back to the anchor colors that we used um, for this color scale, um, we created it and turned it into a color palette. And here I'm just using Monochroma to view it, um, which is a package that I built to help us all manipulate colors. And um, the good thing about if you're using R is that you can also use the color blinder package, uh, which allows you to simulate what this looks like for people with different color perception issues. So we can do that here and we can see that the palette uh, still works. The colors are all distinguishable uh, between each other, which is reassuring. You can also use color blinder to have a look at what your plots look like. I'm skipping ahead here, but here's a plot with the, the color scheme in it. And if we just feed that into Colorblinder CVD Grid, it reproduces it. And, and we can see again that the colors work well um, when we are simulating what it looks like to do. So a great tool to use um, if you're looking to develop your own color schemes. We've got our colors. We now need to think about fonts. So uh, we want to have fonts with easily distinguishable characters. Part of the challenge with DataViz is that the text ends up being quite small um, a lot of the time. So you want to make sure that it's a font that's not too wide, that you have to scan a huge amount of space in order to get the, the information in, but also not too narrow, that things end up being all jumbled together. So you need to look for different things in your fonts to make sure that it's easily readable, and um, even when it's pr written pretty small. Um, there's a, quite a fun test uh, using the characters 1, I, and L. Um, see if you can type those in. Do they look different from each other? Um, and if they don't, then you might want to rethink your, your choice of font. Um, are the letters C, E, and O distinct enough? If you squint at your screen, do they just look like three similar circles? Um, or can you see them as being quite different? 
And then you're also looking for a lack of symmetry between letters. So the D and the B are not perfectly symmetrical from each other. And the Q and the P are probably slightly more symmetrical here. This is just the default font that I use for, for the code and the slides. Um, in this context, I also wanted to think about letters that I knew were going to be used a lot. And I wanted to check what the numbers were going to look like, because I knew that we were going to use this font in data vids where you're going to be reporting numbers as well. In putting it together, you want to make it easier, easy, as easy as you can for your end user. So you want the fonts to be easy to find and install. Um, I find that truly type fonts work better. Uh, they play nicer with RStudio than lots of other variants. But again, you can try, try your luck with different types of font files. Um, you want a font that's got italics and bold, um, and you want all the numbers and special characters that you're going to need. And as I said before, you want it to be easy to read. So here's the font that I settled on for a title font for, uh, for Claire and her project. I was looking actually for a really strong G. I wanted the G to be distinct from a C because I knew that the word just the phrase gestational diabetes was going to come a lot, come up a lot in the stuff that she was doing. Um, and we can see that the other letters work quite well with the criteria that I talked about earlier, that lack of symmetry, the fact that the C does look quite different from the E and the O, um, and the one IL test works well as well. Um, and then for looking for a font that was going to work with that, um, I suggested Nunita Sans again using the same criteria to try and figure out, is it going to work? Looking for fonts with a similar shape um, so that they would pair well um, with each other. Now, when you're looking at fonts, you want to make sure that they're fonts that you can use. Check the licenses. Um, normally, if you're going for a Google font, you're pretty safe. Uh, you need your bold and your italics. Um, and another tip that I only picked up more recently was to make sure that you have fonts that are the same base size as each other. Uh, which isn't the case here, but we can hack a solution to that um, if we end up with this problem. Uh, my go-to for font inspiration is Oliver Schondorfer. He's got a brilliant website called printmytype.com uh, where he has a whole load of resources that you can go and have a look at. And again, that's linked um, on the talks page on my website. If you play around with fonts in R, you will have come across the fact that it can be really frustrating and it can be hard to get it to work. Um, the current received wisdom is to install your fonts locally, um, and then I tend to restart our studio. Um, and if you've got the system fonts package installed, um, that should normally have also installed the rag package and the text shaping package. What you then want to do is make sure you set your graphics device to AGG, uh, which is in your RStudio options. And um, you can see it just there. There's a little drop down that you want to click on to make that work nicely. And then I'm about to save you probably what was at least a day's worth of bashing my head against a computer. And um, if you're doing this in our Markdown or Koto, you also need to set your graphic device at the start in your knitter options, um, because otherwise you'll find that your fonts work really well in your plot viewer window, but don't render inside the document. So you need to align all of these things together uh, for your fonts, fonts to work well. But still, if you play around with fonts, for long enough, you probably will end up with some point where you want to throw your computer out the window. Don't do it. And um, there is a solution. And part of the solution is the blog post that I've linked at the bottom here by June Cho about uh, debugging fonts in R and R Studio. An absolutely brilliant post uh, with a whole load of ideas that you might want to explore um, for other things to do creatively when it comes to fonts. So we've got our fonts, we've got our colors. We now need to implement it all. So we've got the anchor colors that I showed you earlier. Um, and what I quite like to do is create these as a list. And then what I do is create a bunch of palettes, uh, which are all um, derived from those anchor colors. And what that does is it means that everything has a really consistent aesthetic together. So you're starting from a set of anchor colors and you're building out different palettes from that. So we've got uh, cool colors, they're just a subset of those. Uh, we've got the negative to positive, which is just a subset of other colors and some of that slight variance on the one that we've got in the anchors, but it just keeps it all nice and unified. We can then feed all of this into a bespoke ggplot scale function, um, which then uses these ggplot color scale gradient or ggplot discrete scale functions, pulls all the colors into it and scales them appropriately. So we don't need to worry about how many colors we've got in our plot because this will all scale appropriately. Um, write up the documentation with a few extra touches. So we've got the option to reverse the scale if we want to. We've got the option to use it as a continuous or a discrete scale. Um, and then the palette are nice and easy to use up here with, again, the options specified nicely for the clients down here. And um, for your text colors, what I tend to do is find a starting color that ties in with the rest of the palette. So what I did here was mix together that dark red and the purple. 
and ended up with a middle purple, which corresponds to this, this hex code down here. Um, I then fed that into monochroma again and said go darker, uh, which gives us a very dark purple here, which we're going to use as our dark text color. I then take the dark text color, feed it into monochroma again, this time go lighter, and then we end up with a set of lighter grays that are all still tied in with that deep purple color. And then we can go and apply those to our plots. So Themophilia takes in the custom fonts that we've put in and we build that in to get some text hierarchy. We can apply the colors that we've put in as well. We can remove some of the clutter that we don't need. There's a lot of information that goes into plots that we don't necessarily need. Um, and all those extra bits like relative text sizes, programmatic margins, using element text box simple to make sure that the subtitle doesn't run off the edge of the plot. All these things that you end up faffing around with when you're creating a plot from scratch. And we can build that into the function there. Um, and the whole aim, again, is to effortlessly get that same aesthetic that goes beyond just a color scheme. And um, it's about making it functional as well as making it uh, pretty. So again, we've got the documentation here uh, with a few extra option toggles thrown in. Um, and with that, package Ophelia is born. So we've got two extra lines of code to get us from something that looks like this, which is a basic standard ggplot, um, into something that looks like this, which is on brand, has a nice aesthetic, has the added text hierarchy. Um, same thing again, we can go from this to this using the continuous color scale. We can apply it um, and change the text size as well, which is quite a useful thing to be able to do um, if you're creating um, plots that are printed out on different size documents. Uh, we can also apply this to bar plots. You can faff around with donuts if you want to and make the theme void. Uh, so there's no grid lines in the background. We can apply it to bar plots and do a little bit of extra work in that. But because we've built our functions with those extra three little dots, we can feed additional arguments in uh, that allow us to manipulate the colors in the way that we need them to. And you can then keep building on your theme, for example, removing an axis title, putting the legend at the bottom, all these kind of things. These are all options. And ta-da, we have a set of plots that are all um, on brand, nicely aesthetic, and um, that hopefully uh, make Dr. Melanie smile, because that was part of the, the point of this as well. Um, last time I talked about it, next steps were mentioned. I wanted to add some tables, finalize the documentation, and share the package with the team. Um, sharing it was easy. We just put it on GitHub and then used install GitHub with a, an authorization key. Um, and then we added some tables. So here's the starting point for the table. And all I've done here is used React table and created a React table theme, which uses that purple. And the nice thing about it is that it creates an interactive table uh, with very little effort. Because again, uh, you can change around some parameters. You can also do some fun stuff if you add React table formatter in to create some bars. And again, um, it's just quite fun seeing how it all moves around and it gets you from a basic table to something that looks quite nice. Documentation is all there um, and you can go and have a look at it live um, if you want to. Um, and I even added some articles with some kind of starter code for them to help them get to grips with interactive plots. And we are nearly there. Why not also, while we're at it, use this to build some quarter slides? So I've done that for myself. Why not do it there as well? You could easily add that as a little function into the package rather than making an extension publicly available and you can keep it all private just for the clients. Same thing again with interactive plots. So Sammy was talking about ggplotly. I quite like uh, ggiraf or giraffe. People pronounce it differently. Um, again, you just wrap your ggplot function in it and you can create tooltips. Um, and the fun thing we can do with this package is rather than having a CSS styling string that goes all of this way across, you can save that as an object within the package. Um, and all we've got to do is type this in and call it up. And then our tooltips all match everything else. So there we go. Database design systems, color schemes, set of fonts, studio plot theme, interactive tables, interactive plots, quarter slides. We can also create static tables, commonly used plots, et cetera, et cetera. So much stuff that you can do once you start to package it up and build on the foundation. But it's time to wrap up. Um, so hopefully that's given you some uh, tools that you can go and have fun with, things to explore. Um, but I'm here. If you get stuck, give me a shout. Or next time you hear somebody saying, oh, I have to think of a set of colors for this research project, or I don't know how to make this text work, text work you can send them along to my website where you'll find um, the link to this talk and um, we'll put them in touch with me. I'm more than happy to help. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Wow, I said that was a high bar, but that was most easily cleared.
that was a fantastic presentation. I was so absorbed, I completely forgot to prompt you with five minutes to go. So sorry about that. Um, there's one question that's already popped up on the Slack channel. Have you looked at the NHS branding and fonts? And um, wondering what do you think about their use in charts in terms of accessibility? Uh, the answer is I haven't, uh, but I'm happy to take a look um, if you would let me. What was the second question for accessibility? Oh. What was the second question? Sorry, I missed it. Lynn, can you hear? I don't think she can hear. I'm going to it answer because it's my question anyway. Oh, great. And <laughs> Um, we have colour branding in the NHS, and I just wondered how accessible they were. But if you haven't looked, then that would be a really hard question to answer. I think Lynn's just dropped off, actually. She must have had a technical yeah. issue. So that was my question. Um, I'll, I'll send yeah. you the link to the branding. So, I mean, there are a bunch of tools that you can use. And um, if you look at, if you go to my website and go to the workshop talk that I gave last week, um, which has got a page for the, the slides for that, I've linked a bunch of resources there that you can use to check the accessibility of um yeah of your colors mostly uh, but also some stuff to look out for fonts as well so um have a play around with those but yeah get in touch if, if you want me to take another look that's absolutely fine thank you thanks all right thank you very much for that next up we've got glory talking about data in perinatal mental health Hello everyone. So yes, that is, I'm going to start sharing my screen and hope that it works again. Um, share screen. So just as I try and load this, so my name is Laurie, I work for Nottinghamshire Healthcare and uh, NHS Foundation Trust, specifically in the mental health services. And my talk today is about using data to address the barriers ooh, let me know, uh, in perinatal mental health care. So I said, I'm transformation analyst, this, all of this stuff is on GitHub. Wasn't sure where to put the links. So I've thrown it at the top there, but I can share it on Slack or somewhere in a little bit. So just to give you some context into perinatal mental health. So this team will generally see people who are at any stage of pregnancy, but primarily they focus on women who are between 32 weeks pregnant and up to 12 months post birth. And they're commissioned to assess 10% of new mothers. Their referral rate is at 11 to 12%. So it would look like it's enough, but they have never actually met their target. Historically, this is because their DNA rate for their initial assessments is at 30%, which would mean that they'd need 15% of all new, mo new mothers referred to be able to meet that target. But obviously, they are not, and there's no point referring extra mothers just to try and meet this target. So it became very clear that actually just referring people for the sake of referring them was not the way to go. We had to work out what were the barriers that were meant that so many mothers felt unable to attend their appointments. The history of doing this DNA regression, we initially did this for outpatient liaison ages ago, and the wonderful Zoe actually helped me and did the SQL code because my SQL skills are next to non-existent. And we ended up with so many files. We had the SQL code, which produced multiple Excel outputs. I had written some very basic R code that helped tidy it up. But because I was having to use SPSS, which is obviously not ideal, but it's a psychiatrist I was working with what he knew. We had some ARCO to try and do this a little bit in R, but also SPSS needs things to be done all numerically. So your categorical variables, you cannot keep, you know, male and female, you have to put zero and one and then label them in SPSS. So we had some ARCO to try to do all of that. Then we produced multiple SPSS files based on when we were doing one way or the other. And so we ended up with 41 files, which was just a hideous mess. Uh, when we tried to refresh the data, because we did the work and six months later we wanted to refresh it, see if anything had changed, we lost several hours trying to even get to that bit. And then when we tried to replicate this for perinatal a year ago now, it fell apart. It would not run. I think we got about a third of the way down the SQL code three hours later, still unable to make it run. So that is when the decision was made to just throw it away, start again. But this time, partly because my skills had improved, we were going to do it all in R. So now we did the SQL extraction in R, and I'm very fortunate that Zoe, who is here, and Milan, who used to work with us, create this bespoke package called Knots HC Data, which does a lot of the SQL extraction for us. And this is specifically for the 
the tables of data that we use all the time. There were some that were used slightly less often, so I just used the normal way that you would extract SQL using those packages. Within R, I created two R files, partly to help with reproducibility, but also just to keep the code from getting very overwhelming. My group and variable is the main one that gets changed when I implement new teams. And also because we've got things like 27 options when it comes to who referred the patient to services. And so the group and variable is just where I tied them up and reduced them to a more meaningful number for the service. And then my other file fact data is what I used to call the bits of the warehouse that I use less frequently. Because things like accommodation status is not stuff that I look at day to day. So I, I tied, did that all over there because that, as I say, involved using SQL code and that terrifies me. I then produced two R markdown files, perinatal extraction and DNA monitoring. And I'll come on to what is in each of those in a bit. And the DNA monitoring perinatal, I have a redacted demo for you at the very end. Data quality. This is always a massive challenge in any piece of analysis. And I'm sure everybody here can feel my pain that we had with this. There were lots of things we wanted to include, but we couldn't. So things like baby age and the number of children was not possible according to the system only 30% of these women even had a child, let alone one of the right age. And we knew that this was poor recording because one of the criteria for being in this service is that they have a continuing pregnancy or they are the primary carer of a baby under 12 months old. If people have an unfortunate outcome to their pregnancy, they go to a separate service, which is called trauma and bereavement. Things like disability status was also very interesting to see where people just struggling to get out the house. We we're also curious about their accommodation status, see how stable was their home life to be able to do things. And also because of this being the perinatal period, relationship status would have been really important to us to see what support somebody had at home from other adults. And I would say number of children would have been really good because trying to get out the house with a six week old is hard enough, let alone if you've got a six week old, a two year old and a four year old. But unfortunately, that wasn't possible. And then we we had a few definitions that we had to set. So an initial appointment isn't just your first, appoint first appointment. You cannot have a follow-up appointment until the patient has been seen. So if somebody had a DNA appointment, so it did not attend, then a cancelled appointment, and then a seen appointment, all of those would count as their initial appointment because they cannot their scene couldn't be a follow-up because they haven't been seen yet. We also included the metric time to first booked, which is how long from the patient being referred to the first appointment that they were offered because that then gives us an idea about the priority that they were put in. When we used IMD, so our index of multiple deprivation, we had to decide between whether we would use the English level or locally we've got one for Nottinghamshire and this is often depending on the catchment of these areas. So although this community team is often Nottinghamshire specific, Actually, there were quite a few people from fringe areas and because of the mother and baby unit being more regional that we actually went for English and our appointment locations we grouped into who did we ask came to us, so that being clinic, who had a virtual appointment. And so while these aren't that common for this group because commissioning says that they have to be seen in person because of the high risk of things like domestic violence, uh, whether we went to then the patient's home or other because occasionally because of access, because of safety and all of those things, we do see people out and about. So we might see them in a library or a coffee shop or just a public space, wherever it is, and try and meet the patient's needs. So the perinatal extraction R markdown file, this is where we did the regression modeling. We applied all the calculations and just generally did the initial analysis that told us where we were going to be. So initially we used all of these variables. Well, these are the variables that made it to the regression analysis. There's lots and lots of other things that were considered, but collinearity we had to remove. So we considered, for example, between the Nottinghamshire district and the PC and the primary care network a patient was under. We went for district because that's partly how the team works better and things like that. Then we have our age at referral, previous mental health history, because actually for a lot of women, this is the very first time they interact with services. But we wanted to see if those had that new mental health services previously, whether that influenced their attendance. HCP role is whether they seeing a medic or a nurse, because when we did the liaison, uh, the liaison regression, actually people really liked the psychologist, really did not like coming to see a doctor at all. So we thought that was kind of important to understand. And then basics like your appointment day and location, as we've discussed before. 
So in the extraction, so we did our normal regression, but if any of you have ever done a regression in R Markdown, the initial output you get out of it's a bit interesting. It's not the most legible, and I have done some re regression analysis, but this can be quite difficult to interpret. So once you did all that, we have turned into a more into more of a data frame that was more useful, and then I used GT to tidy it up and made all our different headers. And that helped then put it in a way that the clinical team could start to get on board with. And then using SJ plot, we produced this output that's on the screen that gave us an idea as to where were things as far as the odds ratio, what worked better and worse. And it has the automatic colouring of the red and the blue, which again helped with the interpretation. Most of the clinical team did not get this. They liked seeing it. Well, some of them get bamboos and they just like the reassurance that they're bamboos and they trust it. But actually the GT table is what they used well. And I've not got a copy of that to here, but it is all on the GitHub if you want to see what the output was, how it looked and what it included. That is fine. The clinical team have approved it. Then we've got the taken results. So the th main things that came out of it is IMD. So the more deprived a woman was, the less likely she was to attend. Age at referral. So older women did attend better than some of our younger women. Our appointment location. And specifically at the time of analysis, home visits were preferred. That has changed slightly since. In time to fixed appointment, the longer people wait, the less likely they were to attend. Uh, in the output, there is also a bit with Rushcliffe. So Rushcliffe is a particular district in Nottinghamshire, but it is the third least deprived area in England. So chances are the fact that they attended very well could be more correlated to their IMD. So that's why we kept in the IMD. And as said, appointment location showed that home visits were the best attended. However, IMD, age and time to first booked appointments information that we've got almost sort of from the get-go. So then when we looked at the implementation, this meant that because appointment location couldn't be predicted, we actually realised that it could be the solution to what we wanted. And yeah, so we need to identify who'd face the most barriers. And we had the service, thankfully, at the same time managed to recruit an extra support worker that could help us reach out to mothers. And so that was really quite useful for us. And our policy currently said that they would only offer home visits to repeat non-attenders or those that actually asked for it, which does add in a barrier to itself because not everybody would know that that was even something they could ask for or have always the knowledge or foresight or confidence to advocate for themselves. So that we changed this so that those that had multiple risk factors, maybe because they were from a deprived area and were a bit younger, or that they'd been waiting a long time, at the point of booking their appointment and talking to them, they would be offered a home visit at the get-go. There was also a clinical caveat here. We could only offer home visits to people that had been risk assessed and it was known more who was in their home because, unfortunately, because of the loan worker policy. Then we had to do our monitoring. So we looked at our DNA rate over time for initial and follow-up DNAs. Although with this work hadn't really focused on follow-up DNA up until this point, it was still useful for them to get a feeling for. We then also made a list of everybody that was on their waiting list and using IMD and age and so on, we sort of derived a bit of a score to see who was the most likely to need a home visit or to be encountering more of these barriers and so on. The team also had quite an interest in ethnicity, it's something that's been discussed in their provider collaborative and so on, but they also didn't have the best rate of recording their ethnicity. So we've added in some information about that because that's what interested them. And they also wanted to see their breakdown of their key demographics. So I'm going to now jump over to the RMD. Uh, boom. So, so this was our monitoring page. There's a few different graphs that show the same thing. However, the, one of their staff is quite big in QI, so some of them liked the bar chart and they found that easier. Some of them liked the SPC chart. And when engaging the clinical teams, although there is a bit of duplication, if, this, if half of it works well for one lot, half of it works well for the other half of the lot, and it just means that they're engaged with this, I will produce this however many times they want if it's what works for them. And this is always a process is what was going to be good for them. And here we have our percentages. So I have shuffled, say this is redacted, I've shuffled some of the data. So it's close to being true, but it's not quite because some patients have had their appointments moved forwards and backwards just to scramble it slightly. But it still gives you the rough idea that they have some months where their DNA rate is really high for initial. 
I mean, it's not much better for seen for follow up, but it's a little bit better, which gives that team some confidence that people meet them and then generally do keep coming. They don't meet them and run away screaming. So then we get to our patient risk initial. So people that scored seven or six goes bright red. Uh, it's not all red. It's a bit uh, aggressive on the eyes, I realise. And obviously everything's redacted and even the referral dates have all been shuffled. So they use this and so they'll go through and go, OK, well, look, these people... So this patient's been on the waiting list for 188 days. We're coming up to offering them an appointment. We'll give them a call and often it'll be the support worker who can then say, you know, would you rather a home visit? What would stop you from being able to attend? And also the support worker calls people if someone has DNA already, because historically that used to be admin. And so admin couldn't have any clinical conversation with them. The support worker couldn't bridge that. And so that's just got their entire waiting list. Then we've got their active caseload for missing ethnicity. That does include when their next appointment is, so the admin could every so often just poke staff. And I've got to be honest, it's the medics that are the worst for this one. So the medics often get an email every week going, can you can you go and tell us what ethnicity everyone is, please? And it's working quite well because there's 66 entries here. And when we started, there was over 100. So we're taking the progress. And then finally, I say they were interested in what their demographics were for their active caseload. And so, again, anything that they're curious about will always add to things so that because it's, it's wonderful to see them engaged. Although ethnicity hadn't come up, as I said, in the thing is actually be influencing their DNA rate. If this is what they're interested in, they want to see how it works, they want to see how it works. So they can see, oh, so it's a very white population, which makes sense. But it's helping them realise, because in Nottingham as a city, we have, it's about 70% white, 30% not. Whereas in our county, it's about 95% white. So it's useful to see. Then they've got their age and they were quite curious about the three different peaks in maternal age. They never worked out why, but there's three peaks in maternal age, apparently. Uh, and then where the patients are from, this, as I said, Rushcliffe have got quite good attendance. The city doesn't, but this also the correlation is to, is it living in the city that's a problem or IMD? Because Nottingham is the most deprived bit of the East Midlands and the 15th most deprived place in England. So again, we had to encounter all of it. But they've been using this now for... What, I think we must be coming on for a year. I don't know. I lose track of all these things. And so they have found some improvements. We've not had as much improvement as we would like with the home visits because it turns out people will hide behind their sofa from us. So, but it was worth a shot. And this is where I've really work, enjoyed working with them because they have been engaged and now they've tried that. It's not worked. We're going to move on to the next thing. So, yeah, that is me. Has anyone got any questions? I'm going to stop sharing. Well, wow, that was really interesting. Um, I have a question. Have you looked at, at um, the, if there's any sort of correlation between patient age and the other factors like, for example, IMD? So we know that there, we did look at a correlation between ethnicity because that's it. They were, the team kept saying to them that they felt that ethnicity was a problem. And while it didn't come up, just because something isn't statistically significant doesn't mean it's not clinically significant. And so that what we found is that people, the younger mothers did have a skew to be in more of a minority ethnicity, which we know also correlates to them being more likely to be deprived. So we know that there is sort of a chance that the younger mums are also in a deprived area, not enough to sort of be able to rule them out and be totally collinear, but it is something that we were aware of that, say, minority ethnicities did correlate with age and a little bit with IMD. Interesting. And uh, of course, the, the almost obligatory question for an NHSR event, um, are you able to share your code? Yes, it's all on GitHub already. I don't know where to put the link to the GitHub, but it's all on GitHub already. Fantastic. Um, yeah, That's I put what we'd love to hear. Thing. I might be able to throw it in the Slack uh, questions answer bit. I oh, don't know. I'll find somewhere. Slash. Oh, uh, fantastic. Now in Zoe, I might make Zoe put it somewhere. <laughs> yes, another reason for people he to head over to our Slack community then. Yeah, I say I don't, I don't know where else you want it. But <laughs> no, I say I did and obviously I've redacted things. The one thing I will say is that our Not HC data package, which say Zoe was very instrumental in making, we aren't allowed to publish, which is a, a thing that we've always been quite upset about. It's something we would love to. And so I have had to redact in the sequel the uh, names of tables because there's something about the copyright with our EPR. 
I can't pretend to understand it. I just value my job enough to not risk it. But the rest of the code is there, including how we sort of tidied up the tables and the data frames and the R markdown. So it's all there, including the outputs, so that you can see hopefully how the two come up because everything has been taken out the outputs that could be sensitive or hasn't been approved by the clinical teams. But the clinical team were thrilled that we were talking about this here. Fantastic. So thank you once again for a, a really interesting presentation. Um, we're going to have a short break now and at five past three we will be back with Alwazi who's talking about uh, patient experience data categorization dashboards. So go and get your brew and join us back here at five past three. Hello, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope that, that you're keen for even more talk of uh, data, dashboards, uh, all that good stuff, because next we have Olu Wazigum talking to us about uh, building an open source patient experience data categorization dashboard. Whenever you're ready. see your slide yes hello everyone um sorry can you see my slide hello yeah okay thank you um it's nice to, my name is Olusha Gnakweje, and today I'm going to be talking to you on how we actually build an open source patient experience data organization dashboard. Uh, so I'm a shiny developer. I work at Northern Share Healthcare Initiatives Foundation Trust. Uh, so today, um, just a quick introduction into, into the project. And uh, so, we actually know that um, NHS Trust actually have rich source of um, patient experience data. That's because uh, from the from the um, friend test data, uh, trust are actually being mediated to kind of um, feedbacks from from patients. So we have reached rich amount of data. Um, but extracting many insights from all of these data can actually be tricky. Uh, especially with from text data, it can actually be tricky. So this uh, dashboard creation was actually part of a larger project funded by Nishes in England to kind of uh, create a, a, a tool Sorry, to actually trust, Sorry. especially those trust without a couple Sorry, large amount of Ashigan. text data. So this dashboard is actually built with our shiny and yeah. Hello, Ashigan. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Could you yes, just stop the fair and we will take the presentation Hello? slides? Hello. <laughs> We've got a bad I connection. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. What we'll do is we'll take the slides to show and then the just give your channel just the sound because I don't think it's coordinated. So if you stop sharing, if that's okay, okay. just stop sharing completely. Don't worry, we've got time because we've got a slot just afterwards. That's fine. Just stop the share on the, um, is that you? Sorry, because no, WTV can not. share the slides for you and then we can free up your bandwidth for just your voice. Oh, okay, thank you. 
So WTV, you, could you take over the... Yeah, it's over sharing, now. so you can continue your presentation. Oh, that's yes. brilliant. I can hear you more clearly now. So thank you. Sorry. Yeah. You might want to start again, and that's fine. We've got time. Oh, OK. 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 Um, so I, as I said earlier, um, so this project is actually part of a larger project funded by NHS England to kind of um, give uh, develop a tool to actually help, um, trust be able to actually make sense of this large amount of patient experience data. Uh, it's fairly those trusts that have little or no capability to kind of make sense of this data who actually does a lot of manual reading of this of this text before they can actually make sense of it. So um, the dashboard is actually built using our shining and it's actually to the kind of on it uh, the um, the patient experience data connected to a machine learning API that a colleague of mine actually built as well. Uh, and you know, kind of show a lot of uh, metrics and graphs that users can actually interact with. A more details into this project is going to be presented by a colleague of mine called Joanne in next week face-to-face uh, -face talk. So she's going to be talking more about the project um, and talking about the machine learning part of, of the project as well. So the, the aim of the two is to actually give um, clinical staffs and patient experience managers kind of useful tool that they can actually use to actually make sense of this of this data. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's important I actually talk about uh, the contribution of people who actually contributed to this in phase one. So we are actually in phase two of the project. I wasn't part of the first one of this project, but phase two um, that we are, phase one actually proved valuable because it actually shows the importance of having um, good foundation um, from the onset at the start of the, of the project. So the project has been open source from day one, all the code and all the thoughts that was actually put into creating the dashboard, all of it has actually been on GitHub from day one. So we actually viewed it to using Golem. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about uh, why we actually use Golem later on. And the, the, the old project just kind of uh, typify a typical um, reproducible analytical pipeline that we've actually heard a lot about at the uh, keynote talk this morning. Next slide, please. So, um, this next slide is just kind of showing you the key features uh, from the that the dashboard kind of uh, do. So users can actually upload that data. They actually have the functionality of uploading that data. That data get pre-processed and cleansed. And a machine learning API is actually called to kind of make the um, predict the category that those comments kind of falls into and predict the sentiment as well, kind of then shows some visualization that users can actually interact with. And users can also download a, uh, a report from the dashboard as well, that kind of where the a report that they can actually use to make uh, a better, if they want to actually do any reporting or something, or they want to actually get those comments out from the, from the from the dashboard. They can also download the underlying data as well, but you no know, having it in a report format kind of serve uh, a different purpose rather than downloading it as an Excel file. So uh, having it as a report also has some visuals and all of the, some of the key takeaway from the dashboard are actually part of that report. Then the because the, the tool is actually open source, you can actually take the code and integrate it into your current solution or kind of extend it uh, as you wish. So that's some of the key features of the of the dashboard. Next slide, please. So this next slide just shows you like the, the development um, process, uh, what we actually, the things we actually use. So as I said earlier, we actually built the the dashboard using our shining, and we kind of use the Golem framework. Uh, the advantage of using Golem is that it actually allows us to be able to actually package the, the uh, code like a R package. So this comes with a lot of benefit like uh, unit testing, 
like being able to actually re reuse your model so you can actually create a model that does a particular functionality within your dashboard and actually have that piece of code do the same thing different part of the dashboard so uh, i think having golem is actually very good because it allows us to be able to actually do all of this then we we built it using shiny we use shiny dashboard framework to kind of um pattern to kind of build the dashboard the dashboard actually connect to a database so having the pull package actually help us to connect manage the database uh, connection and we use rm for uh, managing all our dependencies this this pack this dashboard was actually deployed on our connect and we we use git action to kind of create a continuous integration and continuous development pipeline where you, we are actually able to actually continuously de de deploy and integrate. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in the further slide. Next slide, please. So um, within the dashboard, so the, the solution, I'll, we actually have a single dashboard that we, we are planning to actually roll out to several trusts. We, we actually have Currently, we currently have uh, partner trust that we've actually rolled these out to. Uh, but have, despite having one shiny app, we are still able to actually show individual users uh, the, the data that kind of relate to them. So whenever a user logs in, the, the dashboard is going to know the group they're actually part of. So we create, we assign member of the same organization to a group. It's going to look at that group and pull the right data from the data, from the database and show users that, that that particular features and um, that particular data that relates to their organization so the to your right is just some code snippet of some of the code functions we actually that actually goes into doing all of this kind of identifying users next slide please uh so these are test suit um because you no know, create having a a an automated test is actually very important considering the fact that we're actually in a pilot phase. So a lot of things is gonna change. We need to actually integrate, we need to improve things, we need to change things. So having a, a good test tool is actually very important. So we use test that package for testing all our business logic. And if you are conversant with Shining, we have what we call test server function that you can use to test all your shiny functions. So we use that as well. Um, using more crit package, the reason why I actually highlighted this is because it's actually, it was actually instrumental in doing all our unit tests. It allows us to be able to actually abstract out uh, some complex logic. So like connecting to our database, you won't, we won't be able to actually test some of those connections or functions that actually rely on that connection. We won't be able to actually test it on GitHub when we actually have these tests on um, this test on GitHub running as a, uh, as a GitHub action. So we won't be able to do that. But having mockery package allows us to be able to actually mock that, um, kind of demo that, that behavior. Then we use shiny load test to kind of do all our load testing. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so for deployment, we have three, three pipelines that kind of does all our deployment. So we have one that actually do all of the all of the unit tests. Then we have another pipeline that actually track our development branch. So anytime we actually make a commit or pull request to that development branch, it's going to deploy a development version of that of the dashboard. The, the development version is what the development team actually have access to, and we actually see it. Um, the end users don't actually see that version, but the production version uh, is actually the one that we have another pipeline doing, doing the deployment and that actually is being tracked. So we have a GitHub action that kind of track anytime we make a package release, it's going to deploy the production version on GitHub on Posit Connect. So that's the three uh, workflow we kind of have. Next slide, please. So what next? I'm going to be rounding up now. Uh, so we are constantly improving the dashboard. We are still kind of gathering feedback from users to kind of know how we can better serve them and make this uh, tool more intuitive and more useful for them. We are actively recruiting new 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 trust. So if you think this tool is going to be valuable within your trust, just get in touch.
touch we can actually get on board the code is actually open source we we, we actually appreciate more collaborators and we have piece of issues on on, on github of those things we actually tend to actually incorporate into the dashboard so you can actually take a look and make a pull request that would be highly appreciated i think that's that's all from me thank you Next slide, please. I think the next slide just kind of show like show the the link to the GitHub page um, and the um, documentation website we've kind of built for for as part of the whole project, which a colleague of mine is going to be talking better on next week, and that's my, my contact details. Thank you. Oh, well, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there will be a, lots of questions for you about that over on the Slack. Um, our next talk was due to start at uh, 25 minutes past, but I see that Peter is already here with us. So I think if we start now, that will give you a few more uh, minutes extra. Um, if that's okay with you. That's fine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay then, Peter is talking uh, to us about banishing copy and paste. That's which the dream. I'm sure, I'm sure is a subject close to many people's hearts. So take oh, it hope, away, Peter. I hope so. So yes, um, yeah, I'll be talking about Copy and pasting as, as, as the biggest challenge we face as a kind of operational analyst. So, yeah, so what we can do and what, how we can use R to, to minimise you know, the amount of effort we put into that right click and copy and paste. So, yeah, so my name's um, Peter Andrews and I'll be talking about repeatable, reliable and rapid R solution to doing all of our executive reporting. So a bit about me, um, I guess they call me millennial elder, which means I'm old enough to remember dial up internet and a bit too bit too old for Instagram, bit too young perhaps for Facebook. So I'm kind of in that weird space in between. Um, I've worked for the NHS for over 10 years in the analytical kind of space. Um, kind of just kind of caught into this kind of data science bit in the last couple of years and really just it's so exciting to see how much there is to learn and just listening through the talks today. It's been fantastic in terms of some of the stuff from Bruno and the, I'm kind of touching a bit of rap, but nothing like the kind of standards he was talking about there. But I think just the, the progression of where we were as a profession 10 years ago to where we are now is remarkable, really. So it's, it's really great to be part of this and great to have the opportunity to talk about the small bit of kind of code that we've managed to get into production here at uh, Whips Cross. So I work as a kind of um, the information lead for a hospital here in East London as part of the Bart Health Group. They run four hospitals. They're absolutely ginormous, but we have a huge kind of overhead in terms of ticking all the boxes about making sure our governance is up to date and making sure that our quality standards are met. And so there's a huge amount of kind of PowerPoints flying around the trust every day. And what we need to do is effectively make those as, as repeatable and as easy to produce as possible. So that's kind of where this, this comes in. So the problem is our data is spread across multiple different reports. Often it lives in Excel and it lives in little kind of nuggets of, of um, or little pockets of, of, of people who have the knowledge of it. And so what we're trying to do is bring it all into our kind of central reporting suite. So to do this, we've uh, developed an R solution. So there's some fantastic R packages out there that will adjust the, uh, address this problem. And the problem being, of course, the copy and paste. So we have one executive report that, uh, that goes out every week and required the copying and pasting of about 54 different graphs. The data is spread across 15 spreadsheets, ranging from little emails that possibly turned up, possibly didn't, uh, spreadsheets that sometimes are updated, sometimes weren't, and click view, click sense. You know, the, the, the number of sales is remarkable. So just to try and document the the, uh, the production of the report took about 10 pages of write-up. So it's, it's very unrepeatable and very unreliable. So effectively, every week we'd have an hour of active analyst time. So that's actively clicking around and... Uh, sourcing, copying, chasing um, people to try and get this report together. It often meant we had one key bit that was missing that would take another couple of hours to chase around. So it's just a lot of our time and effort is dedicated to a, a kind of a report that doesn't need to be like that. So, sorry, and Peter. Then bit, yes, sorry, sorry, yeah. Are you sharing slides? Do you need to yes. share slides? 
No, they're not sharing. Oh, no. Oh, right. <laughs> so oh, we've well, missed okay. some bits. Oh, it's all right. We it's can catch up later. Page. Let me see but... if uh, what's happened here. Uh, let me put my Zoom back on there. So, so you, you, I wonder what screen you're seeing. Uh... No, we're not seeing anything. Oh, just, we're not seeing anything at you. all. Yeah. Just me. Okay. I seem to have lost my little uh, oh, Zoom icon. Here we are. It's minimized it. Right, let's try that. Share screen again. Screen one. I should have done the check at the start, shouldn't I? Every every one of these. Try things. again. It's not sharing. No, you have to that... do it again. Another one. Another one. That's it. It's That's doing better. it. Okay. It's doing... Oh, fantastic. You haven't missed much. There's just a Could big you uh... make, make it big. Um, there we are. Yes. Slideshow, sorry. That's that's showing everything. Uh do you want me to am I showing the wrong uh, screen here? No, no, it's okay. if you go to slideshow menu. Yeah. Middle way. Oh, no, it goes to this. I yeah, can see I think... your next slide. I get a preview. Okay. <laughs> oh, we don't want to do that. I don't want to spoil no, it. Well, no. What I'll do is I'll away. share my big screen, and I think I think that will solve it. I think so. We've got... Okay. Yeah, so we'll try that. So hopefully now you've got... I can see the next <gasps> slide. You can't. Yay. This Tech. is the joy of having three different screens going on. You know, more screens, less productivity is what I find sometimes. So, yes, hopefully, yeah, the problem there in big black and white, Control-C, Control-V, we copy and paste. It's, it's going over what I said before. So... That's working, brilliant. Um, and yeah, for each copy and paste, it's got a slightly different style, there's a slightly different color, uh, touching up, you know, so everything kind of jars a little bit. And the worst thing you possibly see is when they stretch that kind of image to just fit into the report that it's not quite aspect correct, just correct. So someone with a bit of OCD, that really does drive me mad. So, so the solution and um, our packages, so the brilliant work of Pop the Dots, um, Tidyverse, all the ODBC, um, some GT stuff and patchwork, all of these are kind of can be used together to create a, a, quite a simplistic solution to this problem effectively. Um, particularly the plot of the dots work is fantastic. Um, so before we had these kind of overly busy slides that, as I say, each from a slightly different, different time scales, you couldn't really read anything. It was all a bit messy. Um, a solution is to effectively bring all of our code, all of our kind of analysis and our extraction through to presentation into one single R project. So we have that kind of uh, reproducible bit. I call it wrap light because I'm nowhere near the gold standard that, that, that Bruno talked about. But in terms of the, the principle, if you press the button, it runs itself and it runs all the way through to the end and pops out the end is, is what we've tried to do here. So all the data where possible is extracted from the SQL and drawn, drawn through at the transaction level so we can audit it. We've got the R library built into our share drive so that anyone within the analytical team can then reference that library should have negate some of the problems we have with different library types and things like that. But I think, the, uh, the Ren V and the target stuff will help us get in better with that. The documentation within the R scripts, we just might try and follow best practice. But the key thing really is this automation. So if it's to be press one button and it runs through all of the different SQL, uh, runs through all the kind of analysis, all, all the cleaning and presents out these range of uh, SBC charts and drops them into a, a folder with little JPEG tagging so that can then be picked up by other bits or as we've done it at the minute, PowerPoint, but I'm sure there's a, possibility to go that a bit further and use Quarto and explore that kind of world. I haven't quite got involved in that yet, but I think that's probably what's next. Um, yes, yeah, so effectively, as I've described there, so we take our SQL, we extract it, we transform it in R, we output the graphics, and then we pick that up in PowerPoint. We break all the links and send it out to operational teams because they love adding little comments. And one thing that we do find a bit challenging is that harvesting of co comments from operational teams prior to the to the, to the data set. So, so we give them the data, we give them the graphs and they can add their comments in afterwards. So it went from uh, an hour of active time to around two minutes of active analyst time. So that's literally loading up our studio, pressing run, at the end of it, opening up PowerPoint, breaking the links and sending it out. So really has freed up a lot of time for us to do much more exciting things and explore some of these elements that have, have been picked up here. So in, not to get too far into the, into the kind of uh, the detail, not as technical as some of the people here, but effectively it's three key functions. It's the connection to the database at the top. It then runs the SQL, which just pulls up the latest data from our, um, well, from wherever it is housed. Hopefully it's housed in our kind of nice performance stage data set. Um, it then runs through the, the ping, data, uh, ping program, which effectively sets an output runs the SPC pr um, platform and does a dev off command and it writes that picture into a file. So it really is quite simple, quite repeatable, and I'm sure there's more potential to take this further, but effectively just to extract the data, run it into this um, SQL SPC generator and, and, and spit out the, the graphic at the end. So we've gone from that messy, all different, all different colors into this now consistent and concise view. Every, every slide in the PowerPoint is the same approach. It's got the same kind of SPC logic. It's got the same iconography and graphics. 
And so it really just gives us a much more professional kind of uh, output. Uh, so we've got the, the benefit of not only the, 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 the consistency, but we've also got the reliability of, of actually anyone being able to run it. Uh, the handover documentation has gone from 10 pages down to literally pick up this file, run it and, and send it. So it's gone into one page. And so there's a real improvement to our day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week lives as analysts. And we can kind of stop doing all the kind of corporate reporting and copying and pasting. And what we can do is do what we're probably more passionate about doing in terms of the actual analysis, analysis the so what, the, the what next, rather than the this is what's happened in the past. So, so really, I think RAP has given us a brilliant shared approach to, to how we can address some of these kind of um, automation projects. It gives us a kind of something to aim for. I think having that gold standard and something to reach for really kind of gives us a, a shared direction, but even just having a, a kind of consistent language throughout the NHS in terms of having R or, or, or Python um, as, a, as a kind of shared skill set means that we'll be able to share these things much wider. And so something that I've spent a couple of months kind of sorting out, hopefully we'll just shortcut it to the next person so that so really, the more we share, the more we can kind of learn about it. So this, um, this is one example of, of maybe the hundreds of different reports we produce each month, but it's a kind of start here at Bart's Health to say, look, this is what can be done with our, it's a kind of foot in the door to say, look, we've reduced this report from, from an hour to one every week. What, what can we do next? And I think there's going to be more and more that we kind of identify as, as reports or exec, um, pro, exec reports that we can then put into this package and just automate. I mean, there's a, there's a hope sometime in the future to create, have a kind of almost say a standalone uh, server to run these without even the analyst involved, but we'll, we'll see how we get there. Um, I think just having the best practice and the consistency of approach as well, because within SPC, it's such kind of, it's a bit of a nuanced um, subject. Everyone seems to have their own opinion. And so having that kind of NHS plot the dots, this is the way of doing it is really, really handy to, to give us that consistency and just onboarding new staff, training people in what SPC means is, it's really, really handy to have that kind of skill set as a standard. And I think what we're making sure here is that we that the, that the same results come from the same SPC charts, where in the past I've seen all sorts in terms of triggers after one kind of one or two things above the average and people kind of reacting to, to false signals. And so it's really, really useful to have that consistent message. Um, I think once we've got the R, the R template as well, what our next steps, we can then rotate it through different divisions. It's relatively easy to, to kind of put in four loops and to start looking at some of the we uh, picked up yesterday in terms of the functional programming can we then spin it down through divisions or through wards and through specialties to give us that kind of waterboard view of, of performance um, without any additional kind of analytical overhead it's that code reuse uh, mindset really so once we've written it once we can then spin it through the different kind of um, dimensions we have within the business and and hope to get even more um, output out of it and even more value out of it uh, yeah and then future developments I mean I think Every time I go to one of these things and I, I kind of listen in and I haven't been to one in person, but maybe next year I'll go along to it. Yeah, it's just great to hear like where we can go to next. Every year it seems to be there's new ideas, there's new ways of doing things, there's better ways of doing things. So I think it's just having that, that kind of growth mindset. So having a little kind of project, a little bit of time that I ring fence each week to try and look into it and just trying to build on it and, and uh, improve it. It's, it's really been brilliant for me as an analyst and, and really... Uh, Thankful to, to, to everyone who's kind of presented it over the last couple of days and hopefully I'll, I'll be virtually online for the next uh, one next week and to, to see what else there is out there because it's really an exciting time to be an analyst, which I don't think is said very often, but I think it is uh, it's, it's brilliant to see us all coming together after years of, of kind of this sort of slightly weirdly imposed competition to suddenly say, well, actually, look, as an analytical body and as a profession, we should be working together. We can do much better, bigger things and, and we will in the future. So. That's, that's me. Um, sorry about the technical issues at the start, but I'm, I'm glad we kind of got near the end. I've got a little bit of time for questions. If you've got any, I'm more than happy to, once I've figured out, and I need to go, Zoe, I think you've seen you advertise on the R community. You do a GitHub kind of, get started with GitHub kind of thing. I need to attend that because at the minute, again, what, geriatric millennial, not really involved with GitHub at the minute, but happy to learn. But uh, at the minute, I, I, I don't know quite how to upload that, but I will I will attempt to upload all these things into, into some place to, uh, that people can see. So yeah, thank you very, very much for your time and that's, and that's me. Fantastic, thank you very much indeed, Peter. Uh, that was a, a really useful talk that I, I think a lot of people are going to find very helpful in terms of getting them started on uh, taking in some of the uh, drudge work out of producing reports. Um, there's already a question for you over on the Slacks. Um, Paul has asked, do you find that that with automating that you're losing some of the analyze the analyst data quality checks 
you know, actually getting the eyes on the data. I, th I think you're right in terms of it's, it's important to, to not lose that. So there's an element of, of by, it's, it's slight inefficiency by putting it through the PowerPoint side of things and having that kind of eyeball as you see it kind of load through. I think there's, there's some value to actually, when you add your commentary into that PowerPoint, then you're giving it that, that kind of oversight. You're able to kind of flag where, where something has gone slightly um, awry from where it should be. So, yeah, I think, I think that's still an important part of it. Um, so yeah, you're right. There's an, always a balance between saving time and actually making it a bit of a worthless activity. So yeah, I think with the, with the way that we've done it is, is by putting it into the PowerPoint, we we mean the analyst does look through it and look for flags, and we have a kind of manually created dashboard on top that kind of just, again just tries to flag out the, the key messages. Um, haven't put that in this bit because we haven't quite automated that bit yet, but that's again that's something to look to in the future. So yeah, I agree. There's always need that need to have that human view of the data. Yeah, they're never going to totally get rid of analysts by replacing those completely with code. But uh, it's great that we can um, potentially free up some time so that we can use um, use our time more productively. Yes, yes. So thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Uh, next today, we have Lisandro talking about uh, automating reporting. So, oh. Um, developing on uh, on the theme yeah that was a very good um pass to me to um to my presentation um thank you peter that was very useful uh i'll share my screen and the slides should come up now um so no, a little bit about not quite I think you need to press another button for the slides. They're not there. <laughs> Zoom does oh, two no. buttons. <laughs> it's catching people out throughout the day. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what, yeah. Brilliant. It's coming through now. Yes, we, we can see your desktop. And not if this is my slide. And yes, that's your slides. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this will be about me. Uh, my name is uh, Lisandros. Uh, I'm a senior analyst at Edge Health. Um, Edge Health is like um, a healthcare and data analytics consultancy uh, providing services to the NHS. Uh, and in my presentation today, I'll be speaking about our studio in Databricks and, and how we used it to produce more than 300 reports for NHS dental practices. Um, a little bit of overview uh, on what will be presented today. Uh, I'll start by giving you a summary of the objective of our project and the problems we encountered along the way. Uh, and I'll touch on how we use Databricks and uh, to address the issues we were encountering. Then I'll briefly outline how we utilize the Sparkly R package uh, by explaining what it what it is, and by highlighting some of the differences uh, between standard packages in R. And finally, I'll speak a bit about um, uh, how we automated the report generation um, for all of the practices that we had to produce the, re the report for. So um, the project's aim was to create parts for religious dental practices to basically visualize activity for each practice uh, and benchmark that activity against regional and national values. Um, and to do this, we had to bring data together from different data sources and, and handle big data sets. So we started doing the projects locally now, uh, and that caused some problems. Um, the main problem was because of the large amount of data, the main issue we faced was that ours memory and um, processing power that we had um, wasn't enough for our purpose. And the issue continued because um, we couldn't scale up R in our local machine. So what was happening is that we had um, sessions crashing or um, um, very slow processing times uh, at best. Um, so obviously we had to find a solution to make this thing work. Um, so to deal with these issues, we decided to move to Databricks. Uh, 
one thing we considered before moving to Databricks was um, utilize uh, our packages and process things in parallel. Um, while this would allow us to process data faster, it wouldn't solve our issue um, with memory uh, because parallel processing doesn't really increase the amount of data we can process. Um, so the issue would, would persist uh, in that case. So moving to Databricks, um, which basically provides a platform for Apache Spark. Uh, and Apache Spark is a, is a framework for utilizing distributed computing. And what that allows us to do was basically um, share the computing power of multiple machines um, and, and, and utilize uh, the capabilities of, of these multiple machines to, to solve the um, issues that we were encountering. Um, the main advantages were that um, uh, we had the ability to scale up or down clusters uh, based on our needs. Um, and we had the Apache Spark framework, which allow us to um, utilize that distributed computing capability. Uh, both those things allowed us to um, do uh, data processing faster in a simplified manner and uh, make a more efficient um, analysis. And how we actually do it, um, in a, we basically moved from using R locally to using R in Databricks. Um, there are two options to um, use uh, R in Databricks. You can either do it in the platform by a notebook and specifying them our language in the notebook or by installing our studio server uh, on Databricks. Um, we chose this, the latter solution, uh, which basically provides you our studio within Databricks and the environment uh, is pretty much the same uh, as you use it in your local machine. Um, the Spark VR package that we utilize for our analysis is basically an open source package that uh, provides an interface between R and Apache Spark. Um, so it's basically what brings together um, uh, R and Apache Spark and allows, um, allows you to do the processing with, um, uh, within Databricks. Um, and what are the main advantages? Sparkly package is that provides the interface which is familiar um, to, to us. Uh, it, it allows you to write the same dplyr style code as you do in your local machine um, and, and allows interaction um, with Spark um, using familiar interfaces such as dplyr and dbi. Um, to give you a bit more understanding on the main differences from uh, between Sparkly R and standard R packages. And when I'm referring to standard R packages, um, I'm pretty much talking about um, what we are using in them in our local machines. So as I uh, mentioned previously, Sparkly R enables distributed computing uh, by using Apache Spark. Whereas if you're using our packages on your local machine, you are only operating on, in, on a single environment and you can only utilize the resources of that, of, of that environment. Um, Spark layer supports a wide range of data sources, uh, which is uh, not the case with standard R packages that mainly work with data stored in memory or in the local file systems. Um, again, as I mentioned in previous slides, we, we are able to perform data transformations and analysis much faster compared to uh, standard R packages. Um, but on the other hand, we had to learn um, the new functions and concepts that were specific to Spark. Um, and finally, um, we had uh, Sparkly R provides access to the entire Spark ecosystem and, and Spark functions. Um, but on the other hand, um, all of these uh, uh, things um, for, for setting up all of those things uh, 
um, it, it requires resources and it can be quite resource intensive. Lastly, um, that that's you know, on a slightly different note from, from Sparkly and Databricks, um, but I have included this slide to basically illustrate how we use the script um, to look over the reports that we had to produce and get the desired outcome. Um, so everything was based on a master script in our markdown that generated the PDF report that we wanted. Um, and the script was designed to work with the information for one practice. Uh, but we had to produce a report for, for each practice and we had to do that for like more than 300 practices. Um, so what we did, um, we used um, dynamic variables. Um, we introduced dynamic variables using super assignment. Uh, then we used those variables as filters um, and created another script that basically looked automatically through, through those uh, variables um, and adjusting them in the master script. Um, so that allowed us to, um, by just hitting run, looping over all 300 practices, getting the reports, and then if, if any issues were uh, tripping us up, then those um, practices were flat, and then we could deal with uh, the cases that were problematic um, at a later stage. And that's everything. Thank you, everyone. Happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you so much. I can see that uh, that's going to be another uh, area of the video that will be getting a lot of hits. So uh, just to remind everyone, head over uh, to the NHSR community channel um, on YouTube if you're wanting to uh, revisit any of these presentations in order to uh, look at them in more detail. Um, are you going to be able to share your slides? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so also have a look in, in the Slack channel for um, the link to the slides and for any further discussion uh, around the issues covered there. Uh, next up, we have Fran Borson. <coughs> Excuse me. We have Fran Borson, who I can see is ready to go. Uh, bring, bringing yeah. little Henry <laughs> into our lives. I'm glad you said that because that means you can see the slide. So um, yeah, yeah hopefully that's all sharing full screen. Um, yeah, so hi everyone, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm Fran and I work at NUH, Nottingham University Hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna talk to you this afternoon, do a little showcase around a project called Data Hoover. And apologies for the, the terrible joke, I couldn't resist it. Um, hopefully it's a, it's a reporting toolkit that doesn't suck. Um, it's quite good. So uh, yeah, this is a project that deals with a problem that I think must be very common across NHS organisations. And actually Peter's talk a little earlier um, covered some sort of similar ground. There's definitely a theme uh, this afternoon on uh, pipelines and getting data where it needs to get to. So yeah, I'll, I'll crack on, uh, talk a bit about our solution at NUH. So Data Hoover is an R package. And it was originally designed and developed by Tom Smith, who many of you will know from the NHS R community, uh, Insight Manager at our trust. Um, designed to play nicely with um, sort of reporting output packages like Tom's own SPC reporter and the NHS R plot the dots package. Um, currently, it's just used within our trust and it's just internal code, but we're going to get to the point where we'll be able to um, release it because I know. Um, and agree that one of the key principles of what we're doing here is about sharing and um, uh, making our approach and our learning open. So mainly at the moment, it's used in the family health department, which is where I work in uh, mainly in maternity neonatal reporting. Why we built Data Hoover? Well, um, the situation is common. There's there's data data everywhere, and how do you get it into your R? Um, process and get your report to come out the other end. Um, so this solution is is a way of us being able to quickly um, do several things with the several things we needed to do that um, meant that we built Data Hoover. 
I should say, sorry, Tom. Tom's the original creator of the, the package. Um, I think I looked back in the um, Git repository, and the first commit was sort of May 2022. And I've been working, co-developing it with Tom over the last nine months or so. So we, we've got several needs that Data Hoover tries to meet. Uh, we need to be able to respond really quickly for customer requests um, from elsewhere in our trust, in our um, division, for, for data. And we'll go, I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. Um, we need to be able to really sum up that data into counts across the time period, per month, per year, whatever, or sometimes quite often actually rates, so percentages out of certain uh, population denominators. We also need to be able to quickly produce patient level or incident level event lists. So when there's something that needs looking into more closely, um, something doesn't quite seem right with the reporting or there's an audit need, we want a system that's going to going to be able to produce that event list really easily. Um, and in order to achieve all of those things, we've got a whole suite of uh, SQL queries, 300 and something at the moment, just in maternity, um, that we need to be able to interface with in a reliable, reproducible way and also do some of the dirty work of processing that data, getting it into the right format. And we also have multiple databases. I'm sure none of this is is new or special, you know, people must be doing this day in, day out across every trust in the country. Um, but yeah, managing connections to, to multiple databases. And again, Data Hoover has a nifty little uh, tool built in with it, into it to, to manage that. So some examples of how Data Hoover helps us to, to achieve that. Um, so you've got a customer who comes to your data analyst booth with a question. Um, Charlie Brown here has got a really tricky question. I don't think there's a SQL query for this one. Um, and I can identify with Lucy there going, you know, how on earth am I going to answer this question? Okay, the statistical help, very cheap at five cents. So, but a more realistic question that I might get, um, just as a fairly basic example, a core figure for us in maternity. Someone says, oh, how many babies were born at our trust in 2022? So I'm going to go straight to, to Data Hoover to answer this, and it's going to give me a nice answer that's built on a reproducible system straight away. So I've got a little function in there, dhgetData, and I tell it, I know, I happen to know what the reference number is for this one, but it could be anything up to, as I say, 300 and something. Sometimes I've got to look up the number and also what that measure is called and then the start and end dates. I've simplified this ever so slightly for the purposes of this presentation, but it's basically that simple. That will tell me what I need to know. The way it does that is through a sister project, a sibling repository, which is holding all those queries and each measure. So number two there, Bert, has got a YAML config file associated with it, which is where Data Hoover goes, first of all, says, okay, where do I need to go? And the YAML file says, ah, you want data for this year? Well, you're going to need to ask this uh, this database and use this query and use that and go to that database and use that query. Because unfortunately, or fortunately, in our trust, we switched the maternity database systems halfway through 2022. So this simple looking query actually needs to go to two different places to stitch those results together across the uh, transition moment from one system to another. It's brilliant. It saves me doing two jobs. Data Hoover does it in one go. SQL queries then obviously um, there, it's version controlled as well. So we can see any changes or tweaks we need to make to our query, pulls that, pulls those out and manages the databases and the, and the dates. So that's, it's kind of got a nested design to it, the project. So that's one, you might pull that out DH get data and that'll give you an event list. So each row for each event that happened that we want to count. So it will have the detail in there. But more likely we want to be able to aggregate that. So maybe over the calendar year, that was the original question, or maybe someone says, actually, can you tell me the amount per month, the number per month? So Data Hoover's got another function that will take that event list and aggregate it across those dates by a certain period, so by month. And as you probably already noticed, you'd be able to basically pipe one of those into the other. So I do that quite a lot. Um, it's got another little function, create cons, which manages those database connections and sort of lazily calls them as, as required, depending which place we need to go. 
And then, yeah, my data's come out. It's got a few tools that does that, but there's more. So regularly then, we don't just need to pull out and report one particular me measure or metric. We need to pull out a bunch of them. So every month, I'm gonna report to our division across about 70 different measures. And I want a way of being able to do that in one nice, easy process. And Data Hoover is gonna help me to do that as well. So it's not just answering the question with an event list and a summary, but also then creating a data set or a data bundle across a whole load of measures that we'll need to report on regularly. And I've just popped in another thing there, calc rates. So that's going to, um, when something needs to be divided by another thing, um, how many of those babies were born through a C-section, for example, as a percentage. Um, if that's one of my rows that I need to be able to report on Data Hoover, we'll do that dividing process for me and give me percentage figures as an output, as well as the two individual uh, event lists. So the next feather in Data Hoover's cap is a build report data set. And this relies on a couple of other files, as well as our SQL repository. It's got a measure config, which basically has a row for each of those measures telling me, um, recording lots of things we need to know in order to report that. So it's, you know, uh, for example, for something that's re reported as a rate, it's got a record of what the numerator and the denominator need to be. Um, and yeah, so then I can go through um, feed that in and if I've got a particular report that needs certain measures included and others not, then that report config, these are both Excel files, it will read those in and generate me a lovely report at the end of it. I wanted to talk a bit more about some of the design decisions we, we've made in terms of uh, how we built Data Hoover and how we've developed it. First of all, we've taken quite a functional programming approach. Obviously, as an R package, you have to write things in functions anyway. Um, I'm hopeless with base R. <laughs> I only use it when I have to. I kind of skipped base R bit and, and went straight into tidyverse. So I'm, um, I'm very tidyverse oriented in the code I write, and I'm going to not apologize for that today. I know a lot of people feel like with R packages, you're better off using base R as far as possible because you're reducing dependencies and that kind of thing. But Data Hoover kind of unashamedly um, is very deep layer and per heavy and uses a lot of lists to go through and um, process its data, lots of functions that get mapped across, um, data that gets held in uh, nested columns in tibbles and then mapped over, that kind of thing. So that's my own sort of preference. And I feel like it generates code that's easier to read in lots of ways. So I'd much rather use a per map than a L apply or something like that. I just find it easier to, to, to read personally um, and hopefully easier for people to contribute to and, and see what's going on. So I acknowledge that's not everyone's preferred approach to use Tidyverse, but there we go. Um, we've also got quite a lot of what I call deliberate friction. Um, so Data does make life easier, definitely but it also makes certain things a little bit harder on purpose. So when you're specifying your query, you're turning that question into a, a, a function call, you have to specify those things really accurately and it will check them um, and make sure you're asking, you're getting what you've asked for. And if you don't provide things in the right format, your start date and start date time and end date time, it will complain. Well, it will not just complain, it will error. Um, there's lots of things that if it was just a little package for myself that I would be tempted to make some assumptions about what the user needs and use some shortcuts to make life simpler and have less friction. But actually, we want to reduce the chance that you've asked for something that you didn't actually want. So it's going to make you get things right in what you ask it, if that makes sense. Um, or it will give you an error message, which is not the end of the world and is better than accidentally typing in the wrong um, measure name or forgetting the percentage or something in your measure title. Um, so it will it will tell you. And as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. So this is a very powerful package. And when we're dealing with health data, we often have a, a lot of things that, that we have a lot of power over. So I would say with great power comes a great ability to make a mess of things. Data Hoover will try and check that you are doing what you want to be doing, that you know what you're doing. So that deliberate friction is there. Um, we've tended to, so the interface is slightly 
um, slightly heavier than it could be in a way, but for good reason. Um, it's also very chatty. So verbosity is another divine design principle we've got. It tells you everything. Uh, there's a lot of output from these functions. Um, it'll tell you where it's going, what database it's using, um, repeats you back what dates it's querying and all that sort of thing. Uh, it will tell you what we've asked for, tell you what it's doing, and then it'll tell you what, what it's done, which again, not in, in every package, you wouldn't necessarily want that, but for Data Hoover, I think that's really important and nice. And it will, you know, you can have that reassurance that you, you can see what it's doing. So there's just some some principles in terms of, oh, another one, sorry. <laughs> um, assertiveness as well. So we've used assert that quite a lot in the code. So every input that goes into a function gets checked rigorously. And again, assert that will, can, will error if it doesn't get what is expected. And I think that's really important again, when we are working with data, particularly when we're using a package that's in development, um, assert that will give us really helpful We've written really precise error messages, um, custom error messages within the assert that functions that will point you to where something's gone wrong. It's a bit like, I mean, we do have a test suite as well, but I think in terms of writing the code, putting those assertions in um, kind of really helps you check as a, as a developer, as a coder, um, what are the inputs that this function will accept? What are the inputs that it shouldn't accept? Um, so you just want to be really sure that it's doing what you expect it to be doing. Again, it can be frustrating to think, oh, you know, stop being so pedantic. It's a very demanding package um, in, from, uh, in the development, but those assertions are real good um, safeguards that, that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, checks and balances. So, um, and yeah, next steps. So the future of Data Hoover, we'd like to share the code more widely. Um, there's a few reasons why we haven't quite done that yet. Um, maternity at Nottingham Hospitals is the test bed. We're, we're working out, it's been used in, in our reporting pipeline for several months now. Um, so we've ironed out a lot of the, the issues. Um, uh, apologies, the code isn't yet available to point you to. It's not available outside of our trust. It's in, it's in Git uh, repository, repository internally being version controlled. Um, before it goes public, so we would like to get to that point, we still need to... Um, update really the package documentation there's quite a lot of documentation but it's an evolving beast as well so um there's some documentation work and i'm what i'm absolutely give, i think bruno highlighted this earlier in um in his presentation how easy it is to let your documentation go out of date when you're making changes and i'm definitely guilty on that um we wonder whether people might have views or feedback on the structure um I admit you won't have really seen exactly what that looks like from just from this presentation but we've basically got two separate repositories we've got the data hoover code itself the r package and alongside that a whole separate repository with all the uh, sql code and the yaml config files that we'll need to use so those they're really tightly integrated data hoover basically doesn't work without the um sql repository next to it you need to know where that is and that's where it goes um, which is, uh, I think, I think a good thing. I think it's fine from a design point of view. We could integrate the two, but I think it's better to keep them separate. But uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of depend codependency, if you like, between those two uh, projects. We want to promote the package more widely within our trust. First of all, um, we're getting to the point where we're really happy for other people to start using it and see how it works for them. And hopefully, soon it will get out into the into the wider world on a public repository. So that people can make their own versions and submit their own enhancements and so on. And we help end up with a lovely family of development branches or something. So just in summary then, Data Hoover, I'm really happy to, to show off about it. Um, it's just been a very quick overview today for obvious reasons, but it's really a uh, reliable, flexible way to answer customer queries, gives us summary figures or detailed event lists. Another joke, sorry, but it handles a lot of the dirty work um, behind the scenes. And as I say, crossing over different databases, binding data together, um, calculating percentages, that sorts of things. It does have deliberate friction designed into the user interface in order to try and reduce the risk of user error. And it's uh, scalable to large reports where you're wanting to bundle multiple 
uh, metrics together and feed those into a report package. Um, SBC Reporters, one of Tom Smith's packages, he presented about it last year at NHSR conference and I've got a link to his YouTube of that last year. And that's, that is on GitHub, SBC Reporter again in development, but that's already got out into the wild. And that's me uh, having completed my presentation. Do get in touch yeah. and I'll be on the Slack. So yeah, thank you all very much. I'm gonna stop sharing if I can get my mouse to go in the right place. Can I, can I repay your uh, inclusion of so many puns by thanking you for your fantastic presentation? <laughs> hey, it's been a very frantic week. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Which, which all paid off. So thank you very much indeed. Um, can I direct everyone to, as you've already mentioned, the Slack channel for or any follow-up questions? Um, Zoe has uh, just dropped a link in the chat for um, the feedback form. So if all the attendees would please go over there and uh, fill in the feedback form so that we can continue to make these events uh, even better. I know it's hard to conceive such a thing as, as being possible, but we always uh, try to improve. Um, so hopefully next year's talks will be even better than this year's. Uh, and now over to Zoe to uh, wrap up at the end Thank of the day, you. and then you can all uh, log off and contemplate all the many things that you've learned. Thank and you what very you're much. Going to, to implement first. I think I need to work on my puns. I'm not very good at puns, but the, these are good ones and you need that to create packages, I think, to come up with great names like Data Hoover. So I just want to say thank you to all the speakers over these th three virtual days um, and for the attendees coming. It's been a whirlwind of lots of information. And as Lynn said earlier, today and yesterday as well, we, we can do catch up, which is necessary, I think, to go over some of the things that have been shared in greater detail. But um, I think you'll probably all agree it's been quite good having the Slack because the conversations have flowed. So it wasn't just a question and answer thing. This is about connecting to people as well as showing our work. I have thoroughly enjoyed this place, this place, this event, and I'm hoping that you have too. It's wonderful to get such an insight into people's work across NHSR and NHS PyCom communities and beyond. Uh, but they really were just small windows. The, some of them just 10 minutes. That's a, a very concise amount of time to see what may be like months or years of work. So I kind of encourage people who have presented or if you've watched something and thought, I've got something that I could show too, or you want to sort of show a different approach to things, um, to come along to some of our webinars that we do. We do one a month at least to spread them out throughout the year at NHSR community to showcase some more of your work or to expand on some things that you may have had a, an opportunity to talk over in this conference. Um, I'll just say some words. There are some words in front of me. I'm kind of losing. <laughs> it's been intense these three days. Uh, yes. We'll be delighted to hear from you. I think that's the, the key part there. So it's time to end this virtual conference because I'm losing my words now, I'm getting hearts, which is lovely. Um, but I'm hoping that we can continue to chat. And there really has been a lot of discussion in the Slack, which has been so welcoming and wonderful. That's the NHSR Slack, but there's NHS PyCom as well. And I'm just going to wrap it up and say, I hope everyone has a wonderful uh, late afternoon, getting into evening. And um, thank you very much for coming and goodbye.